I would like to call the meeting of the June 27th Board of Trustees meeting uh, closed session uh, to order. Um, the items, oh, roll call. Madam Secretary. Jimmy roll call. Baxter. Here. Jeff Kellogg. Vivian Malaulu. Doug Otto. And Sunny Zia. Here. Uh, there are no comment cards for uh, agenda items on the closed session. So we will go over uh, the issues that will be discussed. Uh, 1.4, personnel pursuant to government code section 54957.6, management team, unrepresented group, conference with agency, uh, designated representative. Uh, 1.5, pen pending litigation pursuant to government code section 54956.9, conference with public agency law group, public agency law group, Government uh, Code Claim Reparking Lot Modular Trailer Restoration Project. A 1.6, existing litigation pursuant to Government Code Section 54956.9A, conference with Legal Counsel Walsh and Associates, cases BC 555666 and BC 575217, anticipated litigation, one case pending existing settlement negotiations. 1.7, existing litigation pursuant to government code section 54956.9A, conference with legal counsel Carpenter, Rothans, and Dumont, case number BC612989. Uh, 1.8, pursuant to government code section 54957, public employee discipline dismissal release. 1.9, Personnel pursuant to government code section 54957, public employee employment performance evaluation, discipline, dismissal release. Uh, 1.10, uh, adjourn to closed session at 3.06. Uh, uh, I'd like to uh, reconvene the Tuesday, June 27th, uh, Board of Trustees meeting uh, regarding the um, closed session. There is uh, nothing to report on 1.6, nothing to report on 1.7. Uh, regarding 1.8, uh, in its closed session, the governing board, after consulting with legal counsel, took action pursuant to government code uh, 912.6A4 to reject the May 8, uh, 2017 government code claim submitted by MZN Construction Inc. in connection with its work on the district's uh, PCC parking lot number two and modular restoration project. The district's vice president administrative services shall serve written notice of the district's rejection on MZ, MZN in accordance with government code 913. Okay, that was uh, 1.8. All right, all right, all right, I'm out of order. But since I've only got one thing left, I'm gonna continue. Uh, and regarding uh, 1.10 uh, personnel pursuant to a government code um, evaluation dismissal, uh, there is nothing to report. Okay, now I've closed the, I've asked the meeting to be opened in open session and, oh, Horel, hello. I was going to ask you to lead the Pledge of Allegiance. This is our new student trustee. Thank you. Okay, Madam Secretary, please call, call the roll. 
Virginia Baxter. Here. Jeff Kellogg. Here. Vivian Malaulu. Here. Doug Otto. Here. Sunny Zia. Here. And student trustee Chavez. Here. Okay, approval of the minutes, uh, 2.5. Second. Okay, it's been moved by Trustee Kellogg, seconded by Trustee Zia. Please call the roll. Not the roll. Please call the vote. Virginia Baxter. Aye. Jeff Kellogg. Aye. Vivian Malaulu. Aye. Doug Otto. Aye. Sunny Zia. Aye. And student trustee Chavez, an advisory vote. Okay, um, 2.6, introduction, special uh, announcements. I would like to turn this over to Trustee Zia, who has a presentation. Sure. Thank you, President Baxter and colleagues. I appreciate uh, this opportunity. It's my pleasure to introduce HDR Engineering, who are represented here tonight by Trico. Uh, and Tom Kim is on his way. He's running a few minutes late. And the latest addition to their team, our very own graduate and valedictorian, Jennifer Hicks. Um, if you guys can please stand up, um, and then I'm going to give them a little bit of time at the end to speak. Um, just to give you some background, um, HDR approached me a few months ago knowing about our commitment to support our students in getting internships and helping them become career ready. Um, they, of course, uh, when they reached out to me, of course, I uh, had to take them up on their offer, and their goal is to start off with a couple of interns. Uh, per semester and hopefully expand on that. Um, and the first LBCC intern, as I mentioned, that they've hired is none other than our beloved uh, valedictorian Jennifer Hicks. And I'm so thrilled about this initiative that they've started and delighted to bring this before you and recognize them today in hopes that they will hire more and more of our students um, and become a shining example for other companies to hire our own so they can study work and live in Long Beach and build a great future for our community and support our local economy. Um, I really appreciate this opportunity, colleagues, uh, and your support in this great initiative. And at this time, I'd like to give HDR the opportunity to say a few words if they like, and I yield back my time. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Trustee Zia. Uh, Mr. Koh, if you would come forward to the podium. And Jennifer. And I know Jennifer, will, too. Jennifer will be speaking as well. I have to add, uh, President Baxter, that um, this opportunity happened right after commencement, the day after, but I don't want to steal their thunder. Uh, thank you, Sandy Zia. Um, Trustee, uh, thank you uh, for it. Um, we are very honored uh, for this program. Um, HDI has been uh, in Long Beach for a long time, over 15 years, and we've been doing business with the port and the city for quite some time. And our office is right downtown, and we've been committed uh, to uh, um, uh, have uh, an internship program with our companies for the last six, seven years. Uh, we started with Cal State Long Beach. We also have high school interns through, through the Long Beach Hall. And, and this year, obviously, like Sunny stated earlier, we uh, uh, in, uh, institute this uh, internship with the uh, community college. And we're very, very happy uh, to have Jennifer on board with us. We're very honored. And we continue to look forward to continue this program uh, in, in the long term. Thank Kay. you. Thank you very much. This is an interest of both Trustee Zia and I to uh, provide more internship uh, opportunities. And I want to thank you. I know Cordoba has have had a number of them for years. And I want to thank you for joining this group. And I hope it's the start of many, many more interns. And Jennifer, congratulations on being our valedictorian. <laughs> thank you. Um, well, the excitement of valedictorian was basically replaced with this opportunity the next day. Um, I'm really grateful that you thought of me. I, I did some research on HDR the day that I learned about them, and they're actually a huge company. They've worked on some very large projects. So I am incredibly excited to have this opportunity. I really do feel that this has been the greatest opportunity I've had so far in my life, and I'm very grateful for it. And that's it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I know you're going to do a great job. Thank you, Trustee Zia, for coordinating this. Thank you, uh, President Baxter. And just one other note um, that I have to say I'm very proud of um, 
Jennifer. She's an architectural student, and um, I failed to mention that HDR is an engineering uh, firm. It's a large international firm, and she's doing uh, taking on both, and I can't wait to hear about her successes, and she's going to make us very proud, and she's going to be the first one and to help us lead the way in supporting more interns. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah, great, thank you. Okay. Just yes, Trustee And Keller. also just thank you very much here. Uh, commencement speech was superb, and you, it really was. It was a very well done. And uh, I know, and we're in talking to you afterwards, even though you have that Millican tie, high school tie, things like that, but uh, nonetheless, uh, well done job. And, and uh, President Baxter, I think all the members of the board are supportive of the <laughs> internships efforts. Absolutely. Not just a couple board members. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Kellogg, and you're right. Okay, then I'm turning it over now to President Romali. Good evening, everyone. We want to celebrate tonight the retirement of classified personnel member Colleen Barber, who unfortunately could not join us tonight. She is a senior administrative assistant here, and we want to thank her for her 12 years of service, serving as a special programs technician from May of 05 to July of 07, and then as a senior administrative assistant from 07 until the current date. She's also been a presenter and a senior clerk, so we want to thank Colleen so much for her service to the college and let her know how appreciated she is. Uh, the next item that I am so excited to tell you about is I w I'm so excited when I can brag about our faculty and our students. Um, about a month ago, Assistant Professor Michael Robertson invited me to his class because he wanted to give me a present. And I was expecting a plant. Uh, it, which would have been fine, uh, but he gave me one of the best presents ever, which was literally a book that had been an assignment, a research study that his students had done in their cultural anthropology class that had looked at how students can become more engaged in LBCC and gave tremendous amount of research and recommendations of things that we can do to make the student experience better. And um, I said, you know, in light of the fact that the board members had given the wonderful suggestion to highlight student achievement at the board meetings, I said, uh, Professor Robertson, we need you at the board meeting to show off the wonderful work of these students, and I'd like to introduce you very proudly to Professor Michael Robertson. Good evening, uh, respected board of trustees and administration. I want to start off by uh, thanking Superintendent President Dr. Ramali for coming out to visit my classroom and invite us to speak, and also to Dr. Miles Nevin behind me uh, for contacting me to set up the details. Thank you for having us over today. Um, my name is Michael Robertson, and I just completed my first year as a probationary faculty on this campus and I teach anthropology in the Department of Social Sciences. I'm joined today by three of my star students who are gonna to speak to you uh, in a minute about their honors project, this ex very exciting work that we've done this past spring together. Um, so just a little bit of background to start off. Anthropology is the holistic study of humankind. And our goal in honors cultural anthropology was to study a really unique and diverse cultural group the culture of Long Beach City College. And for their semester-long project, my honor students engage in real-world ethnographic research and right here on our campus to answer their questions. Uh, and the questions were ranging in content, everything you can imagine. For example, what do students do at the library? Student research that. What prevents students from going to success centers? Uh, do students feel safe walking to their cars at night? And just how influential is RateMyProfessor.com at students choosing their classes? <laughs> Someone researched that. And the students found the answers to these questions by using methods of social science. They reviewed the literature, they designed the research, they practiced fieldwork through surveys, interviews, questionnaires, and they analyzed their data to find meaningful patterns in the results. One of several themes emerged from this body of work, and one of the most emergent themes that I noticed as I was grading all of them 
is that we offer a lot of wonderful services at Long Beach City College. But many of my students found that other students didn't know anything about these marvelous services that we provide. Okay, so that was a common theme that a number of student projects discovered. Now, from the start of this project, I made a promise to my class. I told them if their work was stellar, I would compile it into a single research study, a text, and every student would be the author of one chapter. Well, here it is. And with the hiring of Superintendent President Romali, uh, this 300-page document seemed like a fitting gift to say welcome to Long Beach City College and here's some things that can orient you to our marvelous students. Uh, so we sent out an invitation. Uh, Dr. Molly graciously accepted and was kind enough to accept and uh, our present. <laughs> you want to call it a present? I'm sorry it wasn't a plant. <laughs> yeah, good. And uh, she also suggested that we speak to you today. But I also want to highlight something else. As powerful as the research is itself, I also want to tell you not just about the product, but of the process of doing this work. Now, while I was teaching students to study their own cultural realities, I learned that they may be the most creative forces to learn about institutional change. Participant observation is key to anthropology, and it's when we live and practice just like those that we study. So in this sense, student-led research is a marvelous way to learn about students because after all, they are the students, right? So it made a lot of sense from a social science perspective too. Now in our context, our strategic plan emphasizes this, right? Student-centered equity, innovation, community building, and as many of you know, last month at the strategic plan retreat, uh, our Friday night event, we ha had 30 students come out and they provided invaluable insights that I never could have gotten by talking to them. Right? They had to talk to each other to come up with these ideas and solutions. And it's a very worthwhile opportunity for us to learn from them. So, and speaking of students, uh, three of my top researchers are here tonight to briefly introduce you to the subjects of their study and a little bit about their process. So I'd like to introduce uh, Benjamin Lomeli Jr., Maribel Guerrero, and Chris Corona. Thank you, Professor Robertson. Uh, hello, Dr. Reagan Romali and members of the board. My name is Benjamin Lomeli Jr. Um, technically now, I guess I'm a Long Beach City College alumnus. Uh, just received my associate's degree in sociology and I'll be transferring to UC San Diego this fall. Um, so a little bit about my research that I conducted this sem uh, past semester. Um, so my focus was on advocacy clubs here on campus and how those clubs would affect uh, students' academic success, how they acclimate to college life, and also um, their self-efficacy. And the club that I decided to focus on was Queer Space. It's the only LGBTQ club here at Long Beach City College. And so some of my findings um, actually led me to, uh, well, I guess, I, well, the methods that I used during this research uh, consisted of participant observation, surveys, and interviews. And in those interviews, two students um, who actually took on leadership roles within the club uh, mentioned how that actually motivated them and encouraged them to continue to come to school because they had this leadership role and other members of that club actually looked up to them and relied on them to make decisions within the club, right? And so this um, ethnographic research project actually taught me how to conduct uh, research in a prof professional manner. Um, and it also introduced me to a lot of the students here on campus and it gave me an insight on what it is that they're doing and all the great things actually that they contribute to Long Beach City College, part of the participant observation was attending two outside club events. And um, those, I mean, club events were just wonderful. There were open mics and the whole point of them was to kind of create this sense of community here on campus. And many students came out and actually expressed, like sang, read poems. And so I think that was one of the most meaningful aspects of this uh, research pro uh, project. And, Really grateful that I took this class and that Professor Robertson assigned us with this ethnographic 
research project. It probably sounds weird to say that, but I really did enjoy doing the research and learning from other students. So thank you for your time. And congratulations on your uh, graduation. Very good. Thank you. Good afternoon, board. My name is Maribel Guerrero. I am in creative writing. Major, I am majoring in creative writing, and my plan is to transfer after 20, spring 2018 to CSU LB. The chapter that I wrote within the book that Professor Robertson conducted or pulled together was on the subject of why do students do not eat from the school cafeteria. And within um, the methods I had to do, um, I used surveys and interviews. Within those surveys, I only interviewed the students who answered of whether they would, if they had the option to eat on campus or off campus, which they would choose. And I interviewed those who said that they would eat off campus if given the choice. Within my findings, the common pattern I found as to why students wouldn't do that, wouldn't eat on campus, was they um, I believe that there was a lack of variety within the cafeteria. And most, impor most importantly, students who had special diets such as vegans and vegetarians did not have any or little um, food choices to satisfy their hunger. Mm, one of the most main important foundings to me or that I got at, with, within this experience was um, you never know what's going on within a student's life. I was shocked when within my survey to see not every student ate three meals a day. They usually ate less and this research um, is very important to me and I highly enjoyed it. I thank Professor Robertson for this opportunity for making this really engageful and mindful for Thank you. Hey board, uh, so my name is Chris Corona. I recently graduated from LPCC uh, with, with a associates in philo phil philosophy, I forget my major. Anyways, um, so yeah, so my study was on studying and how people, how students study most well. So I found this, I found what I want. So I came upon this when I was just looking at a wall and I was like, I need to find something to talk about. And I was like, all right. And then I was like, I'm studying in the what sense. So I was like, all right, let me ask students how they study. And then it came to me and not only how to ask students how they study, but why do they study that way? And through my research, um, most of it, which I did on my birthday, which was fun. Um, so through my research, I found out that Many students don't feel comfortable or happy with the way they study. We study, well, I'll include myself in that group. We study most of because we're cre creatures of habit. We do what we feel comfortable with. And when I asked them if, why don't they change their methods, they were like, um, it's what I've been doing. So um, from my research, I basically, I found out that a, it would be a good idea, I guess, if students found different methods of studying. Like for example, I know uh, I think we have read 10 or read, we have a class on that. And that'd be a good thing if we told students more and told them, if you take this class, you'll hopefully find the best way for you to study. And while doing this research, research um, you know, while I did learn about my classmates and my, you know, my colleagues, I guess, um, it was a new way for me to ask random people. Because I would just walk up to students, I'd be like, yo, can I ask you a question? And they'd be like, Sure, I'm not doing anything. So I walk up to them and it showed me how polite and how nice we are to each other. And that's something like before, before Professor Robertson's class, you know, I just, go, I just go to class and then go to car and then just go home. But with the, with the research of the project, I found out more about the student body and I found out just how nice and polite we are. So not only do we learn how to do research, but we also learn about ourselves, our students and how you know, we could approach ourselves when we need help because I'd be like, I, you know, I need to ask you guys a few questions. May I ask you? And pretty much everybody except one person, they were going to class, I understand, said yes. And I was happy about that. So, you know, I want to thank Professor Robertson for this opportunity. And, you know, this is my first research-based project. It was fun and I'm thankful. So, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you Thanks. so much. Okay, my mm -hmm. 
Uh, thank you so much, Professor Robertson and students. And would you please convey to your students that the board and the senior management team are so excited about the results of this because it helps us to continue to improve what is already fabulous and to make it that much better for the student experience and convey to them that while we congratulate them and their success, we're also excited that all of the work that they're doing, we're currently working with institutional effectiveness to pattern code the results and be able to start taking action and execution plans on these suggestions so that future students will benefit from your suggestions. So uh, you leave a legacy here after your graduation and so many students are gonna benefit from your work and we just wanna thank you. Thank you very much. Thank President you. Baxter, can I just ask yeah, a question? Of course. Um, first of all, fantastic job. I'd love to see that book, um, if I may. It sounds amazing. Um, I had a question for the lovely young lady uh, who is one of your students. Um, I'm impressed with all of you. You're fantastic. And I'm particularly interested in the study that you did. Uh, Trustee Baxter and I, um, uh, I don't know if in your research it came up, but one of our biggest issues on the campus is the issue of homelessness and food insecurity. So we have together uh, started a scholarship fund, and um, of course this is my pitch to the rest of my colleagues. Um, if they like, they can certainly support that. Um, but um, one of the things we, we noticed was the amount of uh, students who are dealing with food insecurity and housing insecurity. Um, when you did your research, um, did I'm assuming that ca you came across um, some of the students who uh, are dealing with that, um, it sounds like. Um, I, w I just want you to know if you do, if you f uh, feel comfortable or if they feel comfortable being in touch with you, um, we do have resources that you can point them to. We've started a food pantry. Um, our uh, vice president of student affairs gave a report on the resources that is available. There are scholarship opportunities that they can um, apply for. Um, and then just recently, um, we were able to work with the supervisor's office. Uh, Supervisor Han and I um, worked on this and um, you know, it passed that they there would be dedicated set asides for from the Measure H um, uh, that was passed recently. And it would give them access to the first ha one would be $40 million for housing funding. So they can get the, those opportunities and resources that is being rolled out. So I just want you to know that one, I'm very grateful that you picked that subject. Two, if you do want to pursue being in this area to connect back with these students, there is um, a lot of movement in this uh, arena that we can certainly offer support to you and fellow students that you have made contact. And uh, really appreciate the work that you guys have done. You're, you're doing great. I could see a bright future already in your path. President Baxter, did you want to add on to Yeah, no, thank you, Trustee Z. I was going to bring it up later, but since this is an issue right now, um, we uh, have uh, nutrition uh, available, basically granola bars, click bars, things like that, at both of the um, health centers, the LAC and the PCC, uh, plus water. If students have uh, additional needs, uh, they fill out a, a, what's called a basic intake form. And um, through the money that Trustee Z and I have raised, Outside of the scholarship, uh, we can help students with uh, bus passes and um, f uh, gift card, food, grocery gift cards, and things like that. But we are focusing on the homeless, and we have a, a, a an LBCC employee who is kind of monitoring all this because it's a very technical, and um, everybody wants to have gift cards and gas cards and things like that, but we're, our focus is the homeless students and uh, putting those students in a stable housing. And within the last two months, uh, we have placed two students who qualified for Section 8 in uh, apartments and that, so that 
we took care of the um, deposit and the first month's rent. Then uh, because they had Section 8 housing, they were able to get housing. One of the students is moving in July 1st. The other one moved in June 1st. And um, I made a pitch to uh, college retirees and to, to several people on staff. And we were overwhelmingly uh, received positive things, gift cards uh, to help this student because she and her children were living in a shelter. And so she is moving into her home on July 1st. We're very excited. Uh, she has a job, and most of these students who are homeless have employment. It's just they don't have that little extra money to move into stable housing. And um, so if anyone wants to contribute, uh, and as uh, Trustee Zia said, uh, we will be able to qualify for Measure H funds, but also if anybody wants to contribute, um, uh, they can contact me or, or Trustee Zia and uh, we can explain to it. But it's a very exciting time for us because we believe this is part of the Long Beach College Promise too, that students have a safe, stable place to live and food to eat. So yeah, uh, thank you, Trustee Zia, for bringing that up. It wouldn't be quite a promise if we're letting those students down. And um, we, I really appreciate you picking that topic up. Um, uh, and we'd like, to, we'd like to look at that research, too. Yeah, that'd yeah. be great. Thank you. And Thank I just want to correct something for the record, President Baxter. It seems like um, perhaps Vice President Peterson can uh, touch on this. Do we have the food pantry or do we not? So we have our um, over-the-counter nutrition at both of our student health centers. Okay. And we've expanded mm -hmm. not just um, to bars, but we also have the little meals. Oh, I'm glad to hear that. That they can do in a microwave. Uh -huh. Our focus right now um, is ensuring that there is food for when they're on campus so that they have to immediate uh, to be able to study and participate in class. So. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Oh, um, Simone, Simone, could you take a picture of Mr. Coe and Jennifer? Um, and the board? Well, th with the, okay. With the board. With the board? Okay. Mr. Coe and Jennifer, come on forward. Or, yeah, maybe right here. Come on up here. Professor Robertson? Yeah, no, we're going to do that. And Professor Robertson, you too. And your class.
Okay, 2.7, reordering of the agenda, only for requesting to move agenda items to a different time on the agenda. Hearing none, we will proceed with ASB President's report. Is the new ASB President here? Okay, so I guess we're not gonna have a report because you're later, Mr. Chavez. Okay, 2.9, public comments on agenda items. A total of three minutes will be allotted to each speaker with a maximum of 20 minutes to each subject unless extended by the board president. We have one person, Wendy Cost. Is it Cost or Coste? Is it Cost? Okay. And uh, Wendy is uh, speaking on the elimination of upward bound staff positions, human resources, article 6.3. Good evening, President Romali, the board and senior management team. I have been at the college for just three weeks now. So I'm new here, but I am not new to Upward Bound. I was an Upward Bound director at Salem State University in Massachusetts for 17 years. And for 20 years, I've been a strong student advocate. Um, I'm not sure of the familiarity of the board with TRIO programs, but they fit in light of everything with, that was just discussed and I'm grateful to uh, Professor Robertson and his team for bringing to light many of the issues faced by our Upward Bound students for over 50 years. During the Johnson administration in 1965, these programs were created to help level the playing field for disadvantaged and under-resourced students who were not receiving the kind of education that would lead to um, high school or college success. And um, I'm here speaking today because our positions and Upward Bound were proposed for elimination. We recently had news that one of our grants was not refunded, but we still have one remaining grant serving three of the schools in Long Beach. And these students have benefited from the program for 21 years, and we have a strong legacy of success. Um, to make it a little more personal, as I like the um, the way the students brought to life their examples of their research. Um, why Upward Bound is so effective is because we teach students how to navigate their way to college. In my particular program, our students came um, with little to no English. And I'll give one example. Um, we had a student that came from the Dominican Republic in the eighth grade. She joined our Upward Bound program and with the tutoring that took place after school um, in a six-week summer program, and here the students are on campus for three weeks, and they have a three-week summer residential program at Whittier College. Um, all Upward Bound programs are structured in this way. Um, with that little bit of support, by the time she reached her senior year of high school, she was valedictorian. She went on to College of the Holy Cross, and... Um, Two years later, she went and she received her master's degree at Middlebury College, and she now works in Washington, D.C., where she works with the Department of Defense, and she speaks fluent English, fluent Spanish, fluent Arabic, and fluent Italian. Um, these programs work. I am just here to say that um, we have a staff that has been collectively working really hard to ensure that these students are provided the services they need to navigate their way through high school, to continue on to college, and a lot of the things that were brought to light this evening, simple things that we take for granted, like eating three meals a day and learning what resources to access at a college. Um, things that I think so many of us take for granted are things that our students just don't know and that their parents can't necessarily teach them. And um, again, with 55 plus years of TRIO support, it's, it's bigger than just one program. It's, it's a national effort with... Um, your three, yeah, turn it back on, but your three minutes are up. Okay, so just in close, we're, we're respectfully asking the board just to look very closely at the success that we've had here in Long Beach and to consider continuing the Upward Bound program so that we can serve students for another five years. Okay, thank thank you. you. Thank you, Wendy. Okay, um, 3.1, I gotta turn the page. Oh, it's on this side. Uh, voter participation, election co consolidation update. 
I believe, yeah, Trustee Zia will provide the Board of Trustees with an update on her research. The members of the committee are Trustee Malaulu and Trustee Zia. Thank you, President Baxter. Um, just to, by way of background, Long Beach Community College District is considering options in order to comply with the California Participation Rights Act, uh, which was enacted into law in January 2016 after a successful passage of Senate Bill 415, a bill that was authored by Senator Ben Huizo. Um, this uh, act, the CVPRA, um, requires political subdivisions to align their elections with either the June or the November statewide general election. And um, if that subdivision, which is us, uh, subdivisions uh, average voter turnout in the last four elections resulted in at least 25% less than the statewide average turnout. Um, the, this act, the, CVR, the CVPRA, provides for two compliance options. The first one is to adopt a resolution affirming that the district would utilize the new June or November election date by January 1, 2018, or two, adopt a resolution outlining a plan for the district to comply with the new law no, no later than November 8, 2022, which is considered the safe harbor option. Miles Nevin, our very own Miles, um, I should say Dr. Nevin, uh, provided an initial report to the board on the issue in November 2016, and um, our uh, district legal counsel, Warren Kinsler, provided a follow-up report with a legal opinion and compliance options at the April 2017 board meeting. At that meeting, uh, an ad hoc uh, trustee committee was uh, formed, and it was consisting of myself and uh, Trustee Mala Ulu, um, that President Baxter appointed, um, and we've met. Uh, we've met on the issue, and some of the things that we want to bring back to the board, and it's um, the status of the compliance. After considering our options, um, and the options that was pr that were presented to the board, and discussing them among uh, the committee, the ad hoc committee, it is being recommended that the district adopt the safe harbor resolution outlining a plan to comply with the law no later than November 8, 2022. The safe uh, harbor resolution it must be adopted before the end of the calendar year 2017, which will be December 2017. And this option allows the district to thoroughly consider the impact of an election date change and plan for costs. Also, it allows the district to make a decision that is also informed by potentially additional elections legislation that has been introduced in the current legislative session. There are two bills that, if adopted, would affect elections on pres presidential primary years. The committee will be reconvening in the upcoming months and will keep the Board of Trustees apprised accordingly. And I'm happy to answer any questions the board may have. And I also um, would be remiss if I don't acknowledge our fantastic staff, uh, particularly uh, Superintendent President Romali, who's been very helpful, um, and Miles and Anne Marie Gable, who's been very helpful on the cost side and with the committee. Thank you. Yes, uh, Trustee Otto. Do you know the bill numbers that are pending? Um, the pending ones, I don't, but perhaps um, uh, Miles can speak to that. I, I believe one is uh, spearheaded by Senator Lara. I don't know the bill number, um, but perhaps Miles, you can speak to that. And Miles, if you could uh, correct me if I'm wrong, that's the one that would move the presidential election to March for California, correct, the primary? That's, that's correct. Both bills would move the presidential primary to March, so every four years that election date would change. I don't remember the bill numbers or the other author either, but I could certainly get that for you by uh, tomorrow. And the status of the bills? They're, both bills are alive, so um, we'll be monitoring them. At some point, if they continue to enjoy success in policy committees, they will be condensed into one bill. So I'll find out where they're at and I'll, I'll update you all by tomorrow. And, and one of the reasons we're recommending this option, uh, Trustee Otto, is that uh, once the legislative agenda and the process is fully baked with those two um, bills, uh, we have more clarity and certainty 
um, ideally by the, the deadline. If we don't, we'll bring a recommendation of whether it be June or November 2022. Um, in our recent research, we did uh, conclude that um, it seems, it appears that the um, November uh, timeline would be less costly than the June. It's a uh, minimal cost impact uh, between the two, cost differential, but November is more cost uh, effective, it seems. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Trustee Zia. Sabbatical report 4.1. President Romali, I, I don't see Vice President Long here. Thank you. I'm pleased to introduce you to Allison Murray of the Department of English, who is going to give a lovely summary of her sabbatical report. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much, Superintendent, Vice President. Um, I want to first start by thanking the sabbatical committee and thanking the board for approving my 2015-2016 sabbat sabbatical project and for continuing to support faculty research here at the college, which I think is so essential. Uh, my project was born out of my students' interest in mythologies and um, the, these mythologies that existed outside of classical Greco-Roman, which of course we still cover in great detail in, in the mythology course. Um, but they were always interested in um, mythologies that, that extended beyond that and brought them out into the world. So um, in planning my mythology, I wanted to look at a multicultural inquiry that would help thereby reduce some of the xenophobia that we're seeing um, to a greater extent in the world today. Um, while planning it, I looked at regions of the world that exemplified the ethnography of our college. And so I wanted to look at cultures that pulled in um, students that were represented um, by those cultures. So I matched um, my interest in, in those areas with my prior research in uh, 2006 and seven, where I went to Japan and Guatemala, Ireland, Scotland, Australia, and New Zealand. And I wanted to do some more in-depth research into some of those countries again. So this time I went to Scotland, Australia, New Zealand, um, Kenya and Tanzania by way of the UAE. So I got to experience Ramadan in, the, in Dubai um, in 120 degree weather, <laughs> not being able to drink during the daytime. That was really challenging, but it gave me a greater appreciation and respect for my Muslim students who um, observe Ramadan and, and all of the customs thereby. In um, my first my first visit was to Scotland in 2015, and um, it's where I have some ancestral roots myself. I studied at the, um, I did research at the University of Edinburgh, at the Edinburgh City Library, and also at the National Library. And while I was in the city, I was able to make um, a really amazing discovery at the National Gallery, which was um, uh, finding the Atterbrock Horde there. The Atterbrock Horde is a collection of Viking relics, and it's significant because it was discovered on an, uh, a family peat bog, which all um, families in the Isle of Lewis have access to peat. Um, and it was discovered by Donald Murray, who is my great-grandfather. Wow. So it's, it's a national treasure, and um, actually the Isle of Lewis is asking for it to be loaned back to the island for um, presentation there for the following year. Um, while there, I harnessed the assistance of my cousins who are fluent speakers of Gaelic, and they helped provide a pronunciation guide for the Gaelic words that were included within the literature. And I was mainly collecting stories about the um, fairy folk, Selkies, and the Kelpies, which are of um, keen interest to my students. Um, my next trip was in January 2016, where I went, uh, spent a month between Australia and New Zealand. And you really should do that if you haven't done that yet. Um, I researched at the University of Wollongong, which was the school where I studied abroad when I was a uh, study abroad student myself in my graduate program, and um, also home for the Center of Ad Aboriginal Studies. So I collected a variety of um, myths about dream time that would open up that rather hidden culture to my students. It's one of the oldest cultures on, camp on, on the planet. It's over 20,000 years old potentially older than that. Um, I did research in Auckland uh, about the Maori, looking at their monomyths of New Zealand, specifically the ones on Maui. Um, 
who is a figure that appears throughout all of um, South Pacific folklore and literature. And then in July 2016, I was in Kenya and Tanzania where I did research at the University of Nairobi focusing on myths from the Maasai, the Kikuyu, and also those written in Kiswahili and other East African tribe, tribal languages. Uh, while there, I visited the Ngorogoro Crater, which is a World Heritage Center, and um, also Zanzibar and Arusha. And in Arusha, I made an important contact with the headmaster at this um, St. Thomas School. And he invited us to propose a study abroad uh, with potential student teachers to come to St. Thomas and work there. So upon my return, I worked with the reading department to write a course for their teacher prep AA. And, um, and it was approved through curriculum and through the state, and then we worked together to write a study abroad proposal, which we are hoping to resubmit for calendar year 2019. Um, I also, during my time when I wasn't traveling, I revisited my previous units that I had written, and um, I revised the chapter on Japanese Shinto, on Irish Celtic, um, on Guatemalan Mayan myths, and then I also wrote an additional chapter on Native American myths that my students had been asking for for quite some time. Uh, so the tangible products that were of benefit to the college were um, nine units of myths from different from those different countries, um, a website that I created to house photos and relate stories, and revitalized class lectures that brought these myths alive for my students. And most importantly, uh, I spent a good deal of time encouraging them to study beyond Long Beach City and to use the world as their classroom and um, to study abroad, to travel abroad, and use that as their greatest educational resource as it was for me when I was a student. Um, I use this as an example with my former student, um, Amanda Ferrier, who was Amanda Sosa when she attended classes here, and she fell in love with my stories about Scotland. She ended up going to study in Scotland, met and married her husband there, and they're living there now happily. I got to catch up with her when I was there. So um, again, I want to say thank you so much for this opportunity and for your time this evening. Um, any questions? Uh, Trustee, oh, Trustee Malaulu? Yes. Fantastic. I, I love what you shared about your uh, grandfather finding that. That was amazing. I just want to know what, what English classes you teach. I teach, this is mythology, which is English 33, and there's also an honors section to that. I wrote the honors addendum for that class um, about seven years ago. And I also teach um, next semester English 2, which is intro to lit. Uh, primarily, I do English three honors argument, and um, I do um, online sections of English 105. Fantastic. Good job. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Trustee Zia? Well, this was fantastic. The, the, the sabbatical reports are one of my favorite segments of our docket. I have to tell you, this is amazing. One of the things that I'm particularly interested, um, so when you were in Dubai, uh, how was that in, as far as um, the, the nexus between your research? What were you in particular, um, what was in particular interest from getting, gaining from that region? Um, and you know, how did you weave it in? Um, Dubai was a happy accident because it was uh, the stopping point on my way to Kenya. You can't get a direct flight to Kenya, it takes too long. Um, so you can either go via London, which I have already studied in London, I love it, but I've been there, um, or Dubai. And, and um, my friends were going to be meeting up with me in Kenya, and they were going to be stopping in Dubai, and I thought, I'm going to take the opportunity and go visit Dubai. And it happened to be right in the middle of Ramadan, which we're in right now. So yeah. um, <laughs> It was a really fascinating cultural introduction to the Middle East, but um, it's one of the most westernized areas of the Middle East, and, and because of that, also one of the safest regions in the Middle East. So I felt comfortable encouraging my students to go travel there, and it gave me such a profound respect for um, what the country has done to build itself up out of the desert, out of the sand, out of the dust, and it is one of the most opulent and wealthy um, countries in the whole world, um, but also still having a connection to the ancient Middle Eastern culture, such as in the spice soups and in the gold soups, 
Um, so, so we have still the old Dubai contrasted with the new Dubai, which is always trying to outdo itself in building the world's tallest structure. It already has the Burj Khalifa, and now they're working on a structure that's even taller than that um, without even waiting for another country to catch up to them yet. Yeah, they, they certainly don't have the environmental regulations that we do. Um, that's, that's certain, or the care for human life but um, that we do. But it's fascinating to me that you went there. Um, as a um, Persian Jew, I always respect the Muslims. For 30 days, they fast, and we yes. only have to deal with one day <laughs> as, yes. as the Jewish people. So it's uh, fascinating to hear what you have been able to cover so many grants, and I look forward to seeing um, more of what you covered, um, perhaps after the board meeting at some point, I may c connect with you. Thank you so thank much for you. a fabulous report and for all that you do for the college. And well, thank you so much. Uh, no, Allison, wait, just two things I want to say. I was <laughs> waiting for my colleagues to respond. Um, number one, uh, please remind the students that there is a study abroad scholarship. And thank so you. the problem is they have to apply so if you're talking about the summer of 2018, they need to apply uh, in the fall. Yeah, we wanted, we wanted our program to be accepted for summer of 2018, but the administration felt that it was too soon to restart study abroad. Okay. So they asked us to resubmit our proposal and um, put it in summer of 2019. Okay, well all that means is more money is building up in interest, so there'll be more scholarships. Yeah. Uh, that's number one. The number two, um, I was at the, um, Long Beach Chamber dinner last week, and I uh, met a man uh, uh, during the reception, and he had incredible praises for the English department. Oh. And matter of fact, I'm trying to get him, to, his company, to offer an internship. Uh, he works for an engineering company, but he he he's a writer for an engineering company, and he. I uh, said wonderful, wonderful things, and I don't want to say who they are in public because he didn't mention everybody in the department, but people I, I knew. And uh, I said to him, you know, we always hear the bad things. We, we never hear the good things. Will you please write that down and send it to me so I you know, can send that out? So that was number one. And he also said wonderful things about the math department because he was getting his um, AS degree or AA degree, I'm not sure which, and so he had to take math, and he says, you know, I'm an older student, and I had difficulty, and the math department was wonderful, and then I said, well, you know, we have people come from all around in the summer to take math at LBCC because we have such a wonderful math department. So I thought that was an unsolicited testimonial. Thank you for sharing that, yeah. thank you. I, you know, on my um, six years on curriculum, I worked with the math department at great length, and I can second what your student said about um, the, the fantastic work that they do there, and we've got some outstanding professors in the math department that I'm always really happy to, to recommend to my students. Great, thank you, thank you, Allison. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Uh, oh wow, four point three. Oh, I turned the page. Sorry. Four, uh, 4 point two. Le legislative update report. Dr. Miles Nevins. Thank you, President Baxter, and good, good evening, members of the board. I want to briefly tonight give you a legislative update. What I'm mainly going to do is review the, the six bills that we either actively supported or opposed in the current legislative session. But before I do that, I just want to, within the vein of Trustee Zia's comments, mention that there are many bills uh, introduced every year and many that we're watching. Um, I can't mention them all tonight. Uh, two of the, the ones that we're considering in terms of uh, how they might affect the compliance of the Voter Participation Rights Act were mentioned, uh, but there's many more. So if there are any that you are all aware of or um, are tracking perhaps and you want more information, I'm certainly happy to provide that to you uh, if needed. So to begin with, uh, we are at the point in the legislative session where all the bills have exited their house of origin, either the Assembly or the Senate. Uh, currently the legislature is on recess, but they um, they just returned from recess, rather, and we have upcoming deadlines that are really important. So fiscal bills will be heard by July 14th, policy bills will be heard by the 21st, and then that kicks into gear uh, the floor session. Bills need to be passed by September 15th, and then 30 days after that, the governor will have uh, an opportunity, uh, the deadline, uh, to, to sign those bills. If bills don't get signed, they do uh, go into law uh, automatically. 
This is the second year, excuse me, the first year of a two-year session. So what that means is that bills that die in committee, that are placed on the inactive file, that are suspended for whatever reason, uh, can easily be re resurrected next year. And typically, uh, in those cases, all of those bills automatically do get resurrected by those authors. So I want to start by mentioning our support priorities. The first is the one that's most important to us because it's our sponsored bill this year. Uh, AB 1533 is authored by Senator, excuse me, Assemblymember Patrick O'Donnell. He, of course, is our assembly member just down the street on Spring and Clark. Uh, and this bill would reauthorize the uh, Long Beach College Promise Partnership Act. Uh, before my time, but many of you uh, were here and, and, and may also know that in 2010, uh, then Senator Alan Lowenthal carried a bill for us to implement the College Promise Act, which created a dual enrollment system with Long Beach Unified and gave us the authority in statute to provide priority registration to those high school students uh, because you need that authority uh, in the Ed Code. So that bill sunsets uh, in three days. And so earlier this year, we recognized the need to reauthorize this bill and we partnered with the school district uh, to work with uh, Patrick O'Donnell to do so. The bill has moved just swimmingly through the process. Uh, it's received unanimous votes in, in its policy committees, and it's right now uh, awaiting the Senate Fiscal Committee Appropriations Committee hearing. Uh, we don't anticipate any problems with that. We've been answering questions uh, to the author's office and to the consultants on the committee, and so we think that this is gonna get through. And whereas it was originally written to extend the, the sunset date, we have been successful in getting uh, the sunset language that completely eliminated from the bill so we don't have to deal with this issue into the future. So uh, very happy about where AB 1533 is and I really want to thank Vice President Peterson uh, and Amy Smith and Student Services for all their help on making sure that this gets through and answering so many questions from so many different uh, legislators and their staff. Secondly is AB 1230 which is uh, a repeat effort by Autumn Burke to uh, create a system where the legislature can um, match the $2 million the state gets every year for SBDCs um, through the state budget. Uh, this bill has not been successful in the past, but it's looking like it might uh, be this year. Uh, it's already been amended down to $1 million, but it's still alive, and so we're going to keep watching it. Um, obviously, there aren't that many SBDCs in the state, and we have one of the regional centers, so it could certainly help us. Uh, so it's something that's important to us. The third is AB 705 by Jackie Irwin. This is probably one of the more contentious or hot topics um, in the legislature this year as it relates to community colleges and, and also to the CSU in some ways. Um, this is sponsored by the Campaign for College Opportunity and the California Acceleration Project, uh, the Katie Hearn Group, some of us know that name. Uh, these are two groups that believe remediation is the civil rights issue in higher ed right now and it, in, in in some cases just needs to be eliminated. And so this is their effort to require community college districts to use high school transcript data in the placement of students into those courses, something that we uh, in this district have been doing for some time mm -hmm. and we're one of the pioneers of. So that's why we put this on our radar. It's why we've been supporting it. Um, I do think it will make it through the process and I also think that Jack Irwin will do a repeat bill next year to try to continue to move the needle on this issue. Um, and I, I think those sponsors will be behind her uh, as well. Oh, sorry, I skipped one. Uh, AB 17, this is another repeat bill from Chris Holden. Uh, again, doing something that we in Long Beach have had some success with, which is creating a transit pass program for college students. Um, I started watching this bill last year because it was a priority for our associated student body and it continues to be. Um, so we have offered our support. Um, I know students have actually traveled to Sacramento to lobby on this bill. I uh, don't have any tea leaves on where it will end up because it costs a lot of money, but uh, again, it's on our list and we will, we will keep watching it. The last one in our support priority list is AB 19 by Santiago, which uh, since I wrote this has already changed again. Uh, but this is the effort this year to create a statewide college promise program via a scholarship and you know the main crux of it is that it requires students to maintain a full-time load. Uh, where it's at now is it's been amended down to um, a 50 million dollar fund that is in, was in the state budget and got through and will 
be provided to the community colleges in some type of grant form via the chancellor's office. So districts can use that money in a certain way. Um, I don't know what those parameters are yet. I, I know that we'll, we'll know at some point. Uh, but basically a $50 million um, allocation to this issue. So, you know, again, something that we in Long Beach have been doing uh, in some way, shape, or form, and others are catching on, and now we're going to have uh, a college promise uh, in some way in statute uh, via the budget bill. So we only had one opposed priority this year that I wanted to talk to you about, uh, AB 387 by Thurman. Uh, this bill would have required that all allied health programs and community colleges via their allied health partner, so their hospital or medical center, provide students at least minimum wage for those hours that they have to complete as an intern um, or as part of their program. This was a real concern for our allied health faculty and for Vice President Long uh, because of the cost and frankly because it would likely cripple those programs that we have because uh, our medical partners said they couldn't afford to do that. Um, we heard the same sentiment from other districts. There was a lot of opposition drummed up on this bill. Uh, it ended up becoming inactive after community colleges were um, edited really down in the bill. Uh, so I think it's going to come back certainly next year. It's a priority for uh, the largest statewide labor union, SEIU, and it's considered by many to be just the next step in the minimum wage fight. So I think this is something that we really need to watch, and I know the chancellor's office is watching it, the league's watching it. Uh, so something um, just to pay attention to is this um, allied health issue. Not to take Vice President Gable's thunder, but I did want to mention a couple items on the budget bill. Uh, we did actively support uh, President Keith Curry from Compton and the community college uh, there. Um, in getting them one-time funding to become an independent college. And so that's been a successful effort. Uh, we certainly wanted to support our partners uh, up the freeway, and we did so. Uh, and so that's one budget item that we advocated on. And then the secondly, and certainly the most important, uh, is Proposition 51, the capital outlay issue. So last year, there was a ballot measure, Prop 51, which the voters, um, by a strong majority, adopted, which was the public school and community college facilities bond issue. Um, Despite that passing, the governor only proposed that five of the 29 projects that were previously approved by the Chancellor's Office Board of Governors um, in the budget, were in the budget. And so through a lot of advocacy, um, certainly a lot by our very own Vice President Gable, um, via the statewide facilities group and the Chancellor's Office and others, uh, we were able to get one of our projects back into that priority list this year, which is a really a huge victory and represents um, uh, $20 million for the phase one of, the, of that particular building. Did the second one get into? Okay, so I didn't even know that. Both are in there, so huge round of applause to, to Vice President Gable and to us on that uh, a big victory. So that's it on uh, those bills. As I mentioned, um, we will keep watching them. Once the session is over, I will likely just update this presentation uh, and send it out to you so you know where these bills landed. Uh, but if there are any others that you want me to take a look at or you want the um, bill analysis of, please just ask and I can get that to you. Yeah, uh, Trustee Otto. Yeah, just one quick question on the uh, Long Beach College Promise Bill and, and free tuition. It's part of really a national movement to try and establish free colleges and I wondered whether you have any sense of how that's going or on around the country. So uh, former Superintendent President Oakley was one of the creators of that that national movement right. and we had a seat on their board which uh, I have been able to assume and I, I could say that those states are still actively talking with each other we meet regularly um, you know I think no longer are we trying to partner so much with the White House and the Department of Education but rather uh, work on communication efforts and continue to support states as they develop programs and you still see every month you know another 10 20 being tacked onto the list so I don't see any slowing down um, and we'll certainly stay engaged in that committee, which is led by Martha Cantor, uh, and who's not going to give up on this uh, either. Yeah, great, thanks. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, Trustee Kellogg. When I was on, on, the, uh, on the bill uh, 705, uh, who's, who's the main opposition to that? Um, I can't recall the formal opposition uh, opposers on the analysis, but uh, you do, I mean, I think you, 
you do have some faculty groups that are opposed. Um, I'd have to get that for you. Okay. I, I just can't re can't recall. Uh, and I, I think it's uh, the fact that still we're still having hearings because, as you mentioned, and thank you for doing that, is that we actually are doing this in, at this college and it's been proven to be very successful. So I'm sure they're using a lot of our data to support why it should be used instead of the placement process that puts students in a and potentially a lower uh, course, which frustrates them, which extent, and it runs counter to us trying to make this back to a two-year community college for transfer students instead of a, a four, five, six, seven-year, and this is part of those components. So I was just curious where the opposition was coming from on it, but as long as it's still moving forward, I, I, I hopefully uh, they'll look and see the people that have been successful like, like this college and understand that it actually is to the benefit of everyone. Um, Prop 51, uh, I know those two projects were put back in. Now the last I looked at on the budget, they had gone from five, and I'm really, I was trying to actually scroll down on, they've increased the number from five to 19? 15. 15, okay. Yeah, and so we there, were, there were originally five in the January governor's budget at the um, April letter, so what appeared in the May revise, they added four, which they added our M&N &M building, which is one. the design Correct. build. Um, with the May revise, and then with this final um, uh, conference committee budget, our MM project got added in as well. So both of our projects um, have been approved, so it was 15 out of the 29 uh, that have been approved. And so both of ours are now... Are now Bo both of ours are approved for 1718, so we will start the um, preliminary plans for our MM, Construction Trades One project, and then for our M and N, that's a design build project. So remember, that's the very first, first state-funded design build project ever. Wow. And um, we will start the bridging documents for that project in this upcoming fiscal year as well. That's I just wanted, when I saw that with Prop 51, I, I thought some, and it's it's. And again, the date when this is finally put to bed, you know, the, the governor's signature is today, the governor, but day. Mm -hmm. He signed it today. Oh, he did sign, that was gonna be my question. Well, did he or did he not? So he did, mm -hmm. very good, thank you. Trustee Zia. Thank you, President Ambassador. Um, how much was the allocation from the governor's office for the from the state for those two projects? So for our M&N &M, uh, project, it's just over $20 million, and for MM, it's uh, just over $7 million is the state portion. So w would it fully defray the costs? Uh, that we no, it's a 50-50 match for both of those projects. I gotcha. Um, Miles, great job. Um, one question I had is, and I didn't see it in your uh, presentation, perhaps I missed it, um, I know our Assemblyman Patrick O'Donnell has introduced a bill uh, to keep ICE off campus. Is that something that uh, we're looking at? This is a Assembly Bill 699? Yeah, there's actually probably four or five bills that have been introduced on the topic of ICE or um, how undocumented students are treated on campuses. I have the list, but I just didn't include them here because we haven't vocalized support for them in any formal way. So if you'd like that list cold, I could certainly get that to you. Well, I'm particularly interested in, since we have the DACA resolution that we've unanimously passed as a board, how does it, um, with something like that, would, how would it work when it comes to the federal government, those type of elements? Um, that's just one thing that I want, I'm keeping an eye out for our undocumented students and would like to know more about, okay. or at least updates. That's all I have, for President Baxter. Okay, thank you. Um, Miles, I have just one question. Can I ask it first and then I'll yeah. give it back to you? On um, the Assemblyman uh, Thurman's bill, the next one, Right. the next slide. Um, uh, yeah, okay, uh, 387. Are the uh, universities being held to this or are they only selecting the community colleges uh, that w the allied health programs, the, the uh, providers would have to um, pay the minimum wage. I don't believe In other words, Cal State Long Beach has a nursing program. Yeah. They they do internships and, uh, or not internships, experiential training uh, in hospitals. I don't believe the universities are included, uh, perhaps because those programs have different requirements. Um, 
I, uh, I, not in healthcare, they don't. Okay, I could certainly clarify that for you. Yeah, no, I'm, I, I just think it's interesting yeah. that, that we would be uh, uh, selected as opposed to all two and four year colleges. Right. Anyway, okay. I know uh, technical, trustee, other, pardon, pardon me, other technical and trade colleges were included to your colleges. So uh, for some reason, I'm thinking it was particular to us, but yeah. I'll find out. That's interesting. Okay, thank you. Trustee Kellogg? Just that I, I appreciate the fact that we supported Compton College and their efforts, uh, President Curry and what he did. Uh, Compton College, this gets them back to being an accredited. Uh, they will no longer be under the umbrella of El Camino. They'll be their standalone college again. And, and it's nice to see their hard effort. Uh, essentially, we had two community colleges in California. Compton College, in my opinion, did it the right way. They worked hard and they worked through it. And uh, sometimes I don't think it was fair to that college compared to the other college who was taking a different path. But uh, a Compton College prevailed, and they should all be complimented on it. And, uh, and it's nice to see them back, a fully accredited community college. So it was, it was nice to see our support on that as well. So thank yeah. you for doing that. Thank you, Trustee Kellen. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Nevin. Thank you. Next, uh, 4.3, Facilities Master Plan Update. Uh, Vice President Gable, are you gonna give the uh, introduction? Yes, I would be happy to. So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Tim Wooten, who is our Director of our District Facilities, who will be giving the presentation tonight. And in the audience, we also have our Deputy Director of uh, Planning and Construction, Mr. Medhani Ephraim, as well as our Program Manager for our entire bond project, Mr. Terrence DeGray. Good evening, President Ramali, President Baxter, members of the board and the Executive Committee. Um, I'm happy to be here tonight to uh, give you a construction update on our construction program. Um, our agenda tonight has several Categories, uh, scheduled maintenance, district-wide energy projects, current construction, upcoming construction, current design, upcoming design, and completed projects. Our first project um, was funded in fiscal year 15-16 uh, with scheduled maintenance. It also is being funded with uh, Measure LB, and it's a water conservation project at our PCC campus. Uh, this project uh, is on the corner of PCH and Orange, uh, on that area that's uh, not improved right now. And um, it's going to have low water uh, consumption plants and um, a lot of rockscape, and it's also going to contribute to the uh, um, better looking corner over there on the PCH side. Um, so basically, uh, the contract has been awarded to HBI uh, for the design, preliminary design, um, and we uh, have finished that, and we just received uh, DSA approval. So we're moving forward through the public bid process to get the uh, contractor on board to start the construction by uh, fall of 2017. Uh, the other part of this water conservation project is to convert uh, two areas on our LAC campus that currently um, are irrigated uh, landscape um, with domestic water. And that is uh, building 01 and 02 uh, in building Z. So 01 and 02 is actually going to um, install uh, low water consumption plants, reclaim water, and building Z will be reclaim water only. Uh, we anticipate the start of this again at, at fall of 2017. Uh, more scheduled maintenance uh, funding, 15-16, uh, actually uh, one one-time mandated cost money. Uh, what we did with this was uh, 2.3 million dollars. Uh, we have complete roof placement, roofing replacement for building F, H, J, H, H, and J, J in the roof tile on building K. Uh, construction cost is about 1.7 million. The contract was awarded to Midwest Roofing Company. Uh, we currently are about 99% uh, on building J and 95% on building H, uh, about 85% on the HH, which is the CDC at PCC, and uh, we just started uh, re-roofing building JJ over uh, at the PCC campus. Um, building F and K will start uh, later this summer. We also painted the exterior of building 01 and 02. 
uh, which is complete and it costs us $72,000. Uh, we replaced the old uh, air conditioning unit in building Z uh, and we repaired the rain gutters on building B. Um, fiscal year 2016-17 uh, allocation, state allocation of $2.8 million. Um, we're actually uh, targeted this for uh, removal of architectural barriers and ADA compliance. Um, and so in order to get there, we had to um, hire a consultant to do a CAST study. A, a CAST study is uh, basically experts that are in ADA that come on a campus and identify all the issues. Um, so that the CAST analysis was completed at PCC campus in fall of 2015 and the LAC campus at uh, fall of 2016. Uh, so now uh, we're going to package those um, uh, analysis into a uh, project, a uh, contract. So a district-wide project ADA upgrade, which would bring us into compliance. So uh, West Bergen White has been awarded the as design consultant and uh, we're preparing the uh, documents and the work scope right now to go out to the um, public bid. We're currently about 75% on the CD phase. Um, uh, both projects will be approved by the Department of uh, State Architect or Division of State Architecture um, during, through the process. The other part of the funding uh, we did earlier was a phase one of the, um, the campus-wide door classroom door lockdown project. Um, this was awarded to Montgomery Hardware in August 2016. Uh, phase one is complete, and that phase was basically the, the, the buildings that could make the biggest impact, mostly the new buildings that we already had a lot of the information on. Um, phase two, um, we broke it down to phase two because that's, that's the hard part. That's the old buildings, and we have a lot of field work that needs to be done in order to specify hardware uh, for lockdown uh, hardware on the door. So um, we're currently nearing the end of our work scope and uh, going into uh, talk to contracts about going out to bid. Um, District-wide energy projects. I want to spend just a few seconds here um, going over some of the things that we've done in the past um, uh, to get to where we're going. Um, right in the past, we. Back in 2007, we built two brand new central plants, one on each campus. They're state-of-the-art, they're wonderful. Uh, they're saving us a, a huge amount of money in uh, uh, electric bills. We also did a district-wide building energy management system. Uh, that's basically what controls the air conditioning and in some cases lighting uh, in all of our buildings. So that's a software server upgrade that we did and touched every building on campus. We also did an LAC and PCC infrastructure upgrades. If you were around, you, you lived through that. Um, that was uh, digging up basically both campuses and putting brand new infrastructure on both campuses. Um, we built a parking structure with 450 kW solar generation. Uh, we also participate in Prop 39 year one, where we did a, a, an LAC central plant expansion. Um, which consisted of a new 900-ton chiller uh, to meet our future capacity. And we also did an optimization program, which was our Lobos um, software program that actually helped us uh, optimize the central plants using all the information on our building and management system. Um, we, uh, year two, uh, we decided to, um, to identify LED lighting as a, uh, as a area where we could really get some savings on our electric bill. So we did a uh, campus-wide survey um, to identify what the cost was on the LEDs and what the savings were. And so that gave us a roadmap for not only year two, but three, four, and five. Uh, year two, uh, we did LED lighting in building Z, the parking lots, the tennis sports, the walkways, the pools, and the gyms. Uh, that was approximate savings of about 721 thousand kW a year and 116,000 in cost savings just for the district. Um, moving forward on uh, setting design standards, uh, we participate in Southern California Edison's Savings by Design program, which is basically a, a program where we give our um, uh, construction documents to 
Southern California Edison. They review it, make comments, and uh, you know, see if there's any other thing that uh, they can add in as far as uh, savings in those designs. We also build all our new buildings with 15% above California Title 24, which is equivalent to a lead silver. Um, um, and we also do uh, renovations about 10% above California Title 24. As I mentioned, uh, prop year th three, four, and five, we're combining those into uh, one project. We're combining the funding into one project for one point around $1.8 million. And it's an LED lighting re retrofit that will uh, include building T, uh, the CDC at TCC, and building O2 with an approximate savings of about 207,000 kilowatts a year and about 30,000 a year in cost. Um, notice that proceed has been issued in June 2017. We're in about 10 weeks of uh, sub, uh, submittals and procurement uh, with the installation targeted at the fall of 2017. Uh, looking at the future, um, we have some uh, executive orders from the uh, California State Governor that we're uh, going to use to guide us in the future, uh, particularly B18-12. Uh, which basically, in a nutshell, to summarize it, would be to uh, the governor wants all municipal buildings in the state of California to be built net zero. Um, so these are some of the guidelines that we're going to use uh, to pursue a district-wide energy integrated master plan. Um, so we've uh, interviewed DLR group um, and was selected to write the energy master plan and this energy master plan um, includes a clear path to compliance with the executive orders that I mentioned. Uh, with the goal of being a district-wide net zero campus or district, um, that will be integrated with our 2041 master plan so that we could utilize, uh, we can identify uh, the areas uh, where we can do energy projects without impacting the 2041 schedule and um, our uh, staffing. So we're currently um, in the assessment and planning uh, with that with DLR. They're also going to be an analysis on our central plants to see the, um, you know, whether they meet the needs of the future and what uh, <coughs> recommendations they have for any changes there. Um, so basically we're looking at the project to be this summer, 2017, an estimated uh, completion of the master plan would be the spring of 20. 18 with a cost of about $211,000. Moving on to our current pr uh, construction projects, um, we have building D, the first floor and the second floor. Um, MSP Architects was the design firm. TB Pennick and Sons were awarded the con construction contract. It was basically renovate 16,000 square feet on the first floor and about 2,500 on the second floor. Um, the pr project was uh, started in 2016 and the estimated construction completion date right now is fall of 2018 and that is due to us issuing an intent to terminate the um, letter on 5 to TB Pennick because of the lack of progress on the project and um, uh, subcontractors not being paid. Um, the good news is we are working with uh, TB Pennick right now. They're interested in, in uh, finishing the project, uh, and we're working with a recovery schedule right now with uh, more to uh, more information to come on that. Uh, c another current construction project is uh, a PCC building QQ and RR for the electrical program. HPI Architects uh, Design and RC Construction uh, is the contractor. Um, Building QQ is uh, going to renovate um, five electric labs and three classrooms and nine faculty offices. We'll, so we'll be moving all the functions of building FF to QQ uh, with the Lifetime Learning Center. Um, the construction started April 2016 and um, estimated construction uh, to be uh, summer of 2017. And then of course the, that project always also includes building RR um, which is a renovation and uh, also to be completed the summer of 2017 with a total project cost of $20.3 million. 
another current construction project is our district-wide security monitoring system. Uh, this uh, slide is of the PCC campus, as you can see. Uh, uh, the red in this uh, slide is what, the, what they call facial recognition. In green is where uh, we have camera coverage. Uh, P2S Engineering was the design firm and Pars Arvin was awarded the construction contract. So the project started in October 2016 and um, basically we have about 200 cameras on the PCC campus and about 400 cameras on the LAC campus. Uh, and just to mention that the Long Beach uh, Police Department, this system integrates with their system and uh, they can view all the cameras in an emergency. The total project cost of $10.3 million. Uh, building P, English Studies, another current construction project, um, was awarded to Steinberg Architects. Um, AB Construction was awarded the contract. Uh, we moved everybody out of P into building M&M, &M, which is our swing space area, and the project's going to address ADA classrooms and MEP systems. Um, they're currently working on the interior uh, demolition, as you can see by the slides, and the courtroom is um, partially uh, demo demoed. Uh, construction started in February 2017 and uh, estimated completion uh, fall of 2018 at a uh, total budget of $8.6 million. Uh, upcoming construction projects uh, is the Building J Auditorium. SBA Architects was the design firm and um, we still need to go to public bid on it. Uh, it's going to renovate 37,000 squ gross square feet of the auditorium and it's going to add 14,000 square feet um, on the northwest side uh, for the dance area and storage and some uh, the required elevator that we have to put in. Um, also going to upgrade uh, structural accessibility and fire life safety. So the construction um, to, is scheduled to start in the fall of 2017 with a completion um, a fall of 2019 with a total project cost of about 24.6 million. And then uh, current design projects. Um, this is the uh, LAC Kinesiology Labs and Aquatic Center. Um, the design contract was awarded to Westberg and White in the spring of 2017. Um, it's designed and it's going to renovate all the outdoor uh, kinesiology labs, the softball fields, the soccer fields. It's going to add sand volleyball courts. Um, uh, redo the tennis courts and all associated facilities along with the aquatic center which is a 50 meter 50 meter pool and about 15,000 square foot of support uh, structures um, this will include some artificial turf on some of the builds in uh, anticipated construction start of spring of 2019 the total budget cost of 44.2 million and then uh, I think we have one more current design project and that's the PCC parking structure. Um, HPRA architecture is, uh, was selected to do the bridging documents. This is gonna be a design build delivery project. Uh, so uh, bridging documents is very helpful for the RFP process. Um, so it's gonna address the long-term student and staff parking for roughly about 500 and to 600 uh, vehicles. Uh, it's going to be located on the corner of PCH and um, Walnut, where uh, Lot 5, 6, and 8 are. So right now, the design build entity um, should be selected by the fall of 2017 with a total budget cost of $21.4 million. Well, we do have one more. Uh, sorry. I think we got two more, actually. Upcoming design projects, uh, LAC building, uh, multidisciplinary classroom, building M. Um, funded by Measure E, uh, Measure LB, and also Prop 51 state funding. Um, as Anne Marie stated, this is the first state funded um, project utilizing the design build delivery pro process, so yeah, good for us. Um, and I think you got some of the updates earlier, but uh, the new construction would be about 81,000 square foot, and we are tearing down the old building with an anticipated construction start of fall of 2019 and construction completion of 2022 at a budget of $70.1 million. And uh, then build, uh, PCC building M, the construction phase one 
uh, will uh, completely remodel the west wing of building MM, which houses the HVAC and the carpentry class. Um, projects uh, will include demoli uh, demol demolishing the, the former al alternate fuel section, which is what we call the barn. Um, and the anticipated construction start is fall of 2019 with a construction completion of fall of 2020. The total project cost of 19.6 million. Uh, last category we have is completed construction projects. Last year, uh, we redid the, um, the uh, artificial turf on the stadium. Um, so we replaced that completely and we also um, resurfaced the track uh, at a cost of one about one million dollars which was paid for out of the stadium reserve funds any questions i do but um who would like to go first no you're fine i have my question about the um the softball fields the okay. complex thank okay, you trustee malaulu i'm go ahead oh, oh okay thank you <laughs> okay uh, President Master, I have questions, but it's quite a bit, so... Um, for the Trustee Kellogg for first? No problem. Just very quickly, I mean, just in initially going through on the... Um, and you somewhat answered it on the Aquatic Center, of all the different things we're doing uh, with this in particular, with the uh, sand volleyball courts, tennis courts. In there, we, we talked about insta uh, the installation of artificial turf on some fields. So we are talking about probably the soccer field, things like that, because you mentioned it. I was curious until we got the final. We had just replaced the one at Veterans Stadium with the track. So those are probably the soccer field, things of that nature. And it's still their start. Is I didn't know it was 2019. I thought it was earlier than that. Uh, no, we've got to go through a, des is that a, des a design process. Um, okay. So that's roughly about a two-year process of uh, going through uh, schematic design, uh, final uh, construction documents, DSA review is usually at least six months. Um, yeah, if we're lucky. If we're lucky. Yeah. Uh, all right, I was just curious because there's a lot in there uh, from the, uh, the, the pool, you know, getting that up there and also with the, the fact right now with there's, it seems there's sand volleyball courts but the fact is right now our, our women's team, they actually head down to the beach. Um, that's where they actually won championships down there, but um, there's a lot there. And so obviously I would love to see it move quicker, sooner rather than later, but uh, it's impressive to see all the things we are doing. So thank you very much. Hey, Trustee Zia. Thank you, Tim, great job. I wanna commend you and your staff and um, Vice President Gable and of course, President Romali for really providing detailed information. I really appreciate that. Um, I have a few questions. Um, I know we passed the Community Student Workforce Agreement back in, I think, February of last year, if I, if I recall correctly. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, is that applied to these projects? Where is it applied? And then are we gonna get uh, updates at some point of the local impact it's having as it relates to our projects? Um, for example, are we hiring students? I'm not sure if that we had that uh, as an element for uh, pre-apprenticeship and apprenticeship opportunities so that they can also work on our projects here. That's one question I have. And um, yeah, if you wanna answer that, I can move on to the next one. Right now, Belt and P is uh, the first project, and I believe the, uh, the video camera project is also uh, using the PLA. Right, so when, when we approved it, we followed the master plan with the projects that were slated to come up for construction with the next five years. So um, as Tim mentioned, currently the video surveillance project and building P are both um, under the CSWPA. The outdoor kinesiology labs and aquatic center will be, as will be the, the parking structure. So all of the, the projects that are coming under construction within the next five years fall within that. Oh, which, does it have the element that um, provides opportunities for students to work on some of these projects? I can't recall. Not to my knowledge. Okay. Uh, I believe it's m mostly uh, uh, where all the labor comes out of the union uh, hall itself. 
students can go through those programs and work on our projects. Um, on your page nine. Tr Trustee Z, I think uh, Vice President uh, Bynum. Trustee Z, if this helps, um, part of the agreement was to work with us at Long Beach City College and get some grant funding for pre-apprenticeship programs. So we have an agreement with the Building Trades Council um, to put students either um, in the workplace or if they're eligible, and we're getting quite a few people that are eligible to apply for um, apprenticeships at the union, and we're actually getting some of our students hired. So we're running a pre-apprenticeship program with the Building Trades Grant Council as part of this agreement to set up these um, PLAs. Perfect. Um, the more we can expand on that, that would be fantastic. Um, on um, Page nine, the executive orders you were referring to um, that the governor has passed, um, is will there be cost impact? Um, of course, it's all about the dollars and cents. Uh, um, and I'm assuming the GHG emissions stands for greenhouse gas emissions, is that yes, right? That's Never mind. that's correct. And the zero net energy, is that zero emissions? Or it, uh, it's basically zero net energy is that your your building produces as much of electricity as it uses. Okay, so would this be um, cost neutral? Because if uh, when was this uh, executive order passed? Um, the executive order, I can't remember the exact date, but it was last year. Okay, um, so that, it's uh, presumably after the master plan went into effect. Yes, um, right. and we're that's part of the energy integrated master plan is to look at all the, the cost impacts. Um, generally, uh, there are cost impacts, but there's also energy savings. Okay, have we done a cost benefit analysis to see if we g we're getting savings from that? We will be doing a cost benefit okay. analysis um, integrated into the energy master plan. Okay, well, I'm certainly interested in seeing that to see what kind of cost savings we can bring to the district and apply it to our um, uh, savings, hopefully. Um, the other question I had, uh, uh, on your, you mentioned on page 11, I believe it was T.B. Pennick. Is that? Yes, uh, T.B. Pennick. Well, are they, uh, is this notice uh, to terminate is for them or did I misunderstand? Yes, um, there was a letter of intent to terminate issued on May 22nd, 17, uh, to TB Pinnock um, okay. because of the lack of progress on the project and contractors not being paid. So are we getting stop notices? Yes. Okay, well, that's no fun. Um, I appreciate you guys taking action on that. And then um, I believe on your page 20, you talked about upcoming projects. Um, just uh, if you can, for my edification and for the benefit of the public, um, how are firms or um, one, um, the entities that want to do business with us uh, can find out or compete for these opportunities? Um, can you speak, or per perhaps Vice President Gable can speak to this and the timeline if that's possible? Well, there, there is a process uh, that we go through and it's, it's basically an RFP. Uh, for a design build entity, uh, so it's put out on uh, the public just like we do for other public contracts um, to invite uh, uh, interested entities in um, filling out proposals. I believe the last one we did, we had about 28 proposals. Okay, so when is the next round coming up? Oh, do we know? The next round for the RFP? Yes. Yes. Um, well, we're working on that right now to uh, get it out by the fall of, um, actually, not sure exactly what the date is, but we're working right now to uh, get the RFP pr process going. Okay, um, is there a timeline approximately that we can be expecting? So, well, for right now, the governor is only um, uh, budgeted we're only approved for bridging documents right now. So there's a process that we'll go through um, to hire an architect to do the bridging process. And that's basically to prepare a set of documents that goes into the RFP that identifies the scope a little bit better um, for the uh, entities to uh, propose on. 
So, Trustee Z, are currently, um, as Tim mentioned, within the governor's budget, although the project has been approved, they only approved $954,000 for the, the bridging documents and, the, and, you know, a little bit of the, um, the costs associated with going out to bid. We will not get the approval or authorization from the chancellor's office to go out to bid until the 1819 fiscal year. Um, so Which this, starts when? Um, it starts July 1st, but it'll depend upon if the, gut, if the budget is signed on time and how long it will take the chancellor's office to give us the authorization to go and move forward with the bidding process. So anytime a project is state funding, every step of the way, we have to submit all the documents to the chancellor's office. They have to review it, and then they have to go to the Department of Finance and get the approval before we can move forward on anything. And if we misstep, then we lose our state funding. So it's very critical that, that we make sure and get that approval from the chancellor's office yeah. before we move forward. Well, what about the measure, uh, the bond measures that we have? Well, I mean, we just passed a $850 million bond measure. What, what are the next phases? What are those projects that are coming up um, that is outside of the state funded ones that we can? So the presume? ones that are eight outside of the state funding, um, the, the two that will be coming up to bid probably the quickest, one would be the outdoor kinesiology labs and the aquatic center. Um, we're currently just started the design phase of that. And um, that will probably be well, we're anticipating construction to start spring of 19, so we won't be able to go to bid for that until fall of 18. I, I'm talking about architectural and design services. Do we have op well, some that we haven't already identified architects mm -hmm. and designs on? Um, well, it would be the MM project, and with that one, we would actually be going out within the next, once we get the okay from the chancellor's office to move forward with this project, we would be going out and requesting proposals for architectural services for the MM project within, I would hope, within the next three months of requesting proposals. Okay. Uh, and and then and, uh, I'm looking at the spreadsheet that you have also provided. If you can pull that up, Tim for the benefit of the public. Um, this is called construction budgets and pl plan for buildings. Mm -hmm. um, do you have that? Myra, can you switch the documents for us? So right now you have the, the uh, PowerPoint up. If you can pull up the, um, the spreadsheet, the other, the other PDF attached. If you could put it in there. Yeah, I think it's that desktop version, right? Um, 62717. Through board docs? Is it here? All right. You want me to I there think you it's go. pulled up now. Thank you. So this is a list of all our projects. It's the combined measures, right? Measure E and measure LB. Uh, is that correct? That's correct. And it's uh, a comparison to what was estimated, correct, versus what's projected, what's actual and what's projected, is that right? Am I yep. reading this correctly? Okay. Um, so with within this capacity, it seems like we're, you know, as originally intended in the master plan. When was the master plan again, um, the ad adoption of it? So this is, um, some of these projects were reflected in the, the 2020 Unified Master Plan that was adopted back in um, 2006. But then the, the later items are part of the 2041 Master Plan, which was adopted back in May of 16? Last, year. last, last year. year, yes, May of last year. Okay, so just for the benefit of, of us and also the public, uh, we do track these, is that right? And we're on top of it to make sure we're on time and on budget, um, or if we're not, we make adjustments. Is, I, is that right? Is that a fair assessment? Yes, and uh, the, the 2041 master plan is, is our, uh, our roadmap for that, which mm -hmm. clearly identifies um, a lot of the, the, the start dates on the projects, the end dates of the projects, and, and the funding. So. Um, we're trying to stay 
within that timeline. Right, and of course, in the world of construction, um, nothing is really perfect as you plan out a few years in advance. Um, but I just want to make sure for the benefit of the public and the spirit of transparency that the public know that this is out there um, and we do track it. If they have any questions, this is a public document that they can get it. And it, it, the way I read this, and correct me if I'm wrong, like for example, building a student service is the first line item. Is it fair to say that we had cost savings or because um, there was a credit of $1.8 million, is that right? Uh, that's correct. We had our original budget of $16.9 million and all expenses on that building were fifteen point one. Okay, so not only were we on budget, we were under budget. That's correct. And um, the timeline, uh, the projection, it was just, uh, we fell a, a little bit short on that, correct, when the actual, but. Yeah, that was another project where we terminated a contractor uh, okay. for a lack of performance. Uh, so we, we lost uh, um, three to five months on that, okay. if not more. Yeah, like, and, you know, as we all know, it's not perfect circumstances and you can't have a crystal ball, but I certainly appreciate you laying this out here. Um, and it seems if you scroll down, it seems that overall we're netting zero, correct? Because it's, we're finishing with all the projects at 98.1 million, is that right? Or am I, or no, I'm sorry, that's one of the projects. Um, are we netting zero with the sum of all these projects with the adjustments? Well, if you reference the 2040 yes. master plan schedule, yes. Okay. All right. That's all I had, President Baxter. Thank you again, You're Tim. Appreciate the update. Okay. okay. Thank you. But uh, Vivian, I'll turn it over to you for just a second. So I just want to clarify. So if someone wanted to know if we are on time and on budget, where would they go to find this information? Well, we do have the 2041 master plan listed on the website, okay, and so we also have some other financial uh, information, such as this on our website as well. Okay, so it's on the website, and where would they look if they wanted to look on the website? Would they type in master plan or? Uh, well, it, it's located on the under the facilities uh, uh, website under the bond uh, program. Okay. All right, thank you, I appreciate that. Okay, Trustee Malaulu. Just really quick, thank you, this is great. Um, very informative and helpful. On page 18, um, I just wonder if there's a way that you could uh, add or you know, provide to me a legend of what some of these are. <laughs> I can almost figure out, um, you know, for example, the baseball field, the E, is that mm. existing baseball field? Yeah, I apologize. This was a lot of uh, site plan to try to get into the presentation. But if you um, reference the top left corner, uh, that is the, the practice field for the soccer. Uh, in the middle of that is the One second, field. Tim. So for the, for, since you're starting at the PP, like mm -hmm. for PPF, what does that stand for? You know, I apologize. I can't see that on my uh, screen. Uh, but it stands for, it's a legend for the practice field. Because that's okay. what the PPF. So I, I, I was trying to figure out, you know, I, I assumed that the E's were for existing and the P was for planned. And um, I just, I opened up on my iPad, just, you know, dragged my fingers. But I couldn't figure out what the, some of the other ones were. So later, not right now, but if you could mm -hmm. send me a legend, I would, I would like to have that. Okay. Thank you. That is pretty much the case, though, Trustee Malaulu, that the E does signify the existing facilities and the P does signify the planned. So I know you were going to the, the baseball field. It is planned that the softball field will move south of the baseball field. Oh, I saw that. In the, par in the parking lot. Yes. What, what's oh. that other E just north of the existing baseball field one? Is that baseball field two, like a practice field? That's the existing locker rooms for the baseball. Okay, got it. So it says EBF2, existing baseball facility or? Yeah, yes. probably. Okay, all right, yeah, just when you have time. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, I have a couple of things. First of all, I wanna applaud uh, your area and Vice President Gable for using the M&N building for transition 
and saving us a great deal of money in trailer rentals. And I think that's fantastic. And do you have any idea approximately of how much money we've saved by not having to rent portable? Oof. Is it not a right million? Off, not, not right offhand, but I, we probably do a projection. Okay. Just, it it would be millions it would be, that we yeah. saved. And, and now uh, once electrical moves in to QQ and RR, we will be utilizing the B building oh, okay. um, for a lot of the swing space needs in order to avoid trying to bring trailers onto this campus. Well, as well. I, I think that's fantastic and shows that we are very conscious of how we are spending the taxpayers' money. So I salute you on that. Secondly, and this is kind of a crazy question, what kind of a pool are we building? Because it was suggested to me that we have a MRSA pool. Well, um, that, that has not been decided yet. Okay. Um, we're going through the design process, which will incorporate our user groups okay. um, at their input as well. But it basically, it's going to be a 50-meter pool that complies to all the rules and regulations so that they can have a tournament. I do not own stock in MRSA. I don't even, I, as far as I knew, MRSA is a foot disease. But anyway, <laughs> but I was told that it, um, it holds up better in earthquakes because of its construction. So... Keep that in mind. Yeah, yes, that would be an unfortunate I, name for. Uh, <laughs> it is an unfortunate <laughs> name, isn't it? Then, uh, then another thing that concerned me on page 21, you said demolition of the alternative fuels area. What does that mean? Yes, I should have clarified that it's the former um, alternate fuels area, and it's it, it's it's a barn on the end of an MM building, as you know. Uh, Alternate fuels was moved to building J. Oh, that's all I needed to know. Yeah. Okay, very good. I just worried we were getting rid of alternative fuels. Then I wrote down page nine. So, but I don't know what page nine had to do with anything. Those are the. Oh um, yeah. Oh this. Yes. Yeah. Now, um, because of this executive order, are we going to have more solar on campus? My favorite topic. Well, uh, the net zero. Uh, there's really, in my opinion. Uh, very few ways to get to net zero without solar. Okay. So, like I was looking at that great big MN building, and I'm, you know, got a lot of uh, roof space there. <laughs> so, because um, I'm an expert, you know, in solar energy. Although I, I, I don't believe we would be able to put solar on M and N because that would be um, a scope change from what was in our FPP. Mm -hmm. So we won't be able to add solar to either MM or M and N since it wasn't in our final project proposal that was funded by the state. But the reason that we're doing this integrated energy master plan is to give us all of the options that are available in order for us to meet this zero net energy. So whether that be solar, whether that be you know changing out lighting or you know anything else that it could be, and that way we will be able to pick the projects that we're going to get the biggest bang for the buck. So we have 25 million dollars in our 2041 master plan that was approved with our Measure LB for energy projects. Okay. So we want this integrated energy master plan to guide us. Right with what's going to be the best thing for us to do with that funding. Now we are planning at the PCC parking structure, solar will be on top of the yeah. PCC parking structure just like it is here at LAC. And when you say it's on the corner of Walnut and PCH, mm -hmm. well, the, where will the entrance, will the entrance be on Walnut or has that not yet been decided? Currently, that is what um, the design is, and we're going to try to stick with that. But before we can do anything, we're going to have to get the city of Long Beach's sign off on the ingress and egress of um, I was the parking today, structure, as well probably, as Caltrans. Yeah. Well, I was there today, and I parked in that parking lot. Right. So um, it, it's relatively easy to get in, but to get out, you have to go by that telephone pole that's been hit by a number of vehicles, right. uh, not by mine uh and i wondered about that know. will be removed okay <laughs> okay all right well, those are my questions i really again want to salute you tim and medhani and terrence and uh Anne marie for the outstanding job you're doing in uh watching the taxpayers money and getting the biggest bang for the buck from uh our measures which are supported by our wonderful taxpayers in 
the Long Beach Community College District. Thank you. Thank you. Quick, quick question. Oh, I'm sorry, Trustee Otto. Yeah, I'm, <clears throat> I was a little confused on uh, a 4.3B, that's the uh, construction budgets and plans for buildings uh, for both Measure E and LB. The last item is building the OO classroom. It's a $98 million project. Yes, yes, sir, that's correct. Okay, can you talk to me a little bit about that? <laughs> yes, so this is part of the uh, 2041 master plan. We're planning on building a new building over at the PCC campus that will be south of MM and take up part of the parking lot. It's planned to be a 150,000 square foot building. Mm -hmm. And uh, the hope when we originally put this into the plan was to try to bring as many disciplines to PCC that don't currently exist. But then the whole first floor also will be a huge uh, computer lab with over 600 computers mm -hmm. in it. Fantastic. So that's kind of the, the plan for that building. You know, all of the programming obviously has not been done. That will be one of the next construction projects that we start after the parking structure gets done at PCC. Yeah. One more question, I'm sorry. Fair Are there enough. showers? Oh, I'm sorry, I, I thought you were done. So continue. No, it's, well, I, I mean, I, what I was kind of getting to was as, as to this document, um, I, I think if you want to start at ground zero, we can say that all projects that have not been started are on budget and uh, on time. Is that fair? Um, yes. The question is how at any given moment in time we're able to discern where we are in the project, in, in the, you know, in, in our, what we're going to do and, and, and how we're doing. Um, I, I'm, I'm just concerned that this doesn't give us all the information that we might have, although I, uh, if you ask me how I would present it, I have no idea, uh, because it's obviously a very complicated, complex thing to do with things changing literally on a daily basis, and uh, as we learn, you know, almost, uh, well, well, regularly, uh, some contractors uh, go out of business, uh, things change, we renegotiate things and all that, so, I, I just, uh, tell me how we keep, if, if, if I'm a member of the public and I want to look at what's going on at Long Beach City College, um, what's the best way to, to, to do that? Is it this chart? You know, we go from this chart? Because I see there's a lot of information here. Yeah, so this chart was designed to, to try to track that um, in that very case. And so the reason that we put the master plan in there, because that is what, the board adopted right. in our 2041 master plan of when we thought we were going to start construction. So then the very next column over, which is actual or current projected construction start date, as time goes on, if we need to shift when a building is going to start construction, delay it, move it up, you would see the change in that column. So the master plan column will not change because that comes from the master plan but the column, the first uh, column in green will change dependent upon when we're actually going, when we actually start the project mm -hmm. or when we reprioritize. So remember we have a facilities advisory committee on campus that um, is kept abreast and apprised of all of the construction projects and anytime there's a reprioritization, it goes through that facilities advisory committee for their approval um, before we would shift projects, uh, timeline of projects, or even if we need to add uh, budget to a project because the scope changed or programming changed it, it all goes through that committee um, as well. So I think the best way to tell if if the project has changed is looking at those two dates and seeing a difference in those two dates. And, and I, I might suggest that you have another page which just separates them by campus so that if you're a, a PCC fan and you wanna know what's going on there and what's gonna be going on there in the future, it might be easier to read, and the same with LAC, uh, than this uh, overwhelming document which is, I mean, you have to, you'd have to separate them out, and I think you could do that almost with a keystroke. 
We could. It's also project number. If it's if it's a five eight, that's a PCC, or if it's a five seven, that's a LAC. But I know the public wouldn't know what our coding means. <laughs> but okay. we could we could make this into two. A two-page document, one that just lists LAC, one that just lists PCC? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm just worried about accessibility uh, and readability, and uh, uh, if I can't read it, and I, and I, and I can, but, but if, it's, if, if I'm struggling to do it, I, I think you're doing a great job, and, uh, and there's a, t a ton of information presented here, and I just want to um, make sure that it's accessible uh, as well as there, but as accessible as possible. President Master, if I may add, yes, um, sure. I think the, not all of these line items uh, do touch on it, but there are uh, there are references as to which campus, like PCC, Infra Utility Connection. You know, you have um, other ones, but it, uh, it may not be all of them. So maybe we can just, by way of brevity, we can just have it all on one page and just assign which campus it's on. But that's really the management of it, and it's really your call. Um, but I think the trustee Otto brings up a great point, and um, President Baxter, you also brought this up. You know, all of this is public record, and it may be, um, maybe perhaps we can look at bringing it to the forefront of our website so it's accessible to the public, because everything is out there, and it's very transparent. And, you know, having been in construction for oh, almost 20 years, I don't want to date myself, but um, I've never seen a project, um, you know, you project out at the master plan level 10 years, 20 years in advance. There's, I haven't seen one that has necessarily gone according to plan. Uh, could have been just my experience, but mm -hmm. I think we're doing, it looks like we're doing a good job. Um, but perhaps, you know, we could look at updates to the board where we're saying, okay, we're baselining these projects, earned value, project management, those type of things that the public can also gain the confidence and uh, of getting insight into the level of uh, effort and rigor that is already applied here so they can have visibility to it. Mm -hmm. Just some suggestions, but I think we're doing a great job and we can always do better and I'm confident that you guys will, so appreciate that. You're welcome. Okay, thank you very much, Tim, and thank you, your staff and uh, Vice President Gable. Thank you. Uh, 5.1, uh, consent agenda, any item may be removed from the consent agenda and considered separately. Does anyone have anything to remove? I, I do. Uh, yes, uh, uh, Trustee Malalu, which ones? Okay, I have a couple. Um, hopefully they're all real quick answers. 5.5, 5.10, and 5.17. Okay, anybody else? Okay, then I need a motion to, uh, and am I, am I moving too fast? Okay, I can talk about the study abroad scholarship again. <laughs> I, I would object. Okay, yes, 5.5, um, 5.10, 5.17. And could I have motion a to motion to uh, approve all the rest? I'll so make the motion, second. Okay, moved by Trustee Otto, seconded by Trustee Zia. Five point five, five point ten. Oh, who moved it? Trustee Otto, seconded Trustee Zia. Virginia Baxter. Aye. Jeff Kellogg. Aye. Vivian Malaulu. Aye. Doug Otto. Aye. Sunny Zia. Aye. An advisory vote. Student Trustee Chalba, with the exception of personnel items five point sixteen and five point seventeen. Aye. Okay, uh, 5.5. .5. Okay, I, um, I'm i going to try to just be quick, and I'm not sure who the right person would be, probably Vice President Gable, um, but if they're just quick answers, let me know. On page one, uh, contract number 50056.1, I'm just wondering why Presto Sports is so generous to act as a web host for the athletic department for three years at no cost. I, c I can answer that if uh, Vice President Peterson can't, or whoever answers that. So we uh, we're the initial adopters 
of uh, working with this company, um, which spread across the state. And so our athletic director has been very good in convincing them of the benefit uh, that we've provided them, and so they've agreed for the additional uh, contract at no cost. Well, that's very, very generous. You want to know the rest you. of it? Sure. They charge credit card fees, so they are being paid at the other end. Ah. They're, they're charging credit card fees for um, use of the to website? Athle to athletics. Okay, got it. Okay. All right, on page two, contract number... 99745.5 to customers bank it says that we're if i understand this correctly we're paying the bank 3750 or they're charging us 33750 dollars worth of fees to process financial aid awards to students yes so this is um, the entity that we use that supplies the debit cards to students for their financial aid awards and the district pays a fee to them for that service okay but the students are not being charged no. And, no, the and the financial work. aid is obviously coming from you know financial aid correct so do we bank with customers bank? No, we don't bank. So they used to be called Hire One. So I don't know if you if you've refer if, if you've heard that before. Um, they have changed their name to now their customers bank, and um, it is something that we have always had to pay a fee in order to allow the debit card uses, or the students can also have it automatically sent to their own personal bank account. Um, so what it does, it saves us from having to cut checks to the students, and the students just get their debit card, and the funds get automatically put onto their debit card. So it, I think it, it saves the district time. It also saves the students' time of having to pick up a check and then go and cash it and deposit it. That, that I understand completely, and that makes a lot of sense, but in my head, I'm just wondering, since district already has a banking institution that we bank with could we possibly save a few thousand dollars a year because this 3750 is probably just for June May June if we add that up monthly um, could we maybe save money if we transferred that operation to our existing bank and have that rolled into our bank fees our existing banks will not take on issuing the debit cards to all of the hundreds of students that we issue financial aid awards to so it is kind of a niche market and most of your local banks will not do that um, just so the board knows is this something that as part of the uh, BPR process that we're starting this year we are going to be doing an RFP and looking at different solutions that could potentially save us money this is an annual fee the 3750 is an annual fee that we pay for that service Okay, good. So that's not monthly or no. If, 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 Trustee Malu, if I because I've had experience with this, it, it is a very good system because it really saves on the hours and hours and hours of writing checks, students sure. losing checks, um, and it's very seamless because, as uh, Vice President Gable said, uh, it could go right to their bank account. So um, uh, it, it's a really good system. Okay, no problem. Thank you. All right, moving on to 5.10. No. Uh, please take the motion on 5.5. Okay. Oh, that's right. We've got to do the motion. I'm sorry. Okay. I shouldn't have let you speak. Okay, it's been moved by Trustee Otto, uh, seconded by Trustee Zia. For, for what? 5.5. Zia is not present. No. Oh, now she is. <laughs> well, it's a new motion. Okay. 5.5. Oh, for just 5.5. I'm sorry, I need a motion. So moved. Okay. Can I move on, on an item, Michael? Sure. Okay. And, and seconded by Trustee Zia? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's been moved by uh, uh, Trustee Malaulu, seconded by Trustee Zia to approve 5.5. Virginia Baxter? Aye. Jeff Kellogg? Aye. Vivian Malaulu? Aye. Doug Otto? Aye. Sunny Zia? Aye. And Student Trustee Chavez? Aye. Okay. 5.10. Okay, 5.10. I'm going to try to move really fast. The first seven items are backdated to 2016. Just wondering what took so long to get those purchase orders in. So what that signifies, that was the original date of the purchase order. Change orders have been done um, to those purchase orders. So they needed to increase 
the the open purchase order in order to pay the invoices that were coming in at the end of the year. So that's what that signifies. Okay, and and because they're still within our fiscal year that the budget were approved, then it's not going to have an impact on our current year budget. Correct. Okay, on page three, uh, if you go down to the middle, purchase order um, ninety seven, last two digits ninety seven. The career technical education exam vouchers for $15,000. I'm just wondering what, what type of exam, what, I don't know what that exam voucher is, but I, I'm familiar with CTE and the hands-on. So I'm just wondering what that is. So these exam vouchers um, are COMP, T-I-A, A+. So it's a networking security and cloud essential sure. exam voucher. Got it. Okay. Um, page four, purchase order number 913, kind of in the middle. The software license, and I have the same question on page six, if you want to address them both at the same time. Their software licenses, the first one is $35,000. The second one on page six is for thirty, almost $33,000. I'm just wondering what the software is because typically, and correct me if I'm wrong, but usually when we start a new school year, we always have the licensing in place. It's not common to kind of introduce new software, or especially in teaching. So I'm just curious what that is. Because that's a lot of money for new software, kind of middle end of the year. And I don't know how much of that is actually going into technology for instruction or. Um, um, well, this one in particular, it's, it's called Big IP Software License, which also includes the installation and training. So a lot of times uh, with some of our instructional equipment funds, based upon the department planning, it'll take a while to decide how they want to spend the funds. And so this would be the case where they are purchasing it and they will be um, looking into it and having it available effective July 1. This kind of- For the upcoming year? For the upcoming year. Got yeah. it, that makes more sense. Okay, and then that would be the same thing for page six. Which um, yeah, it's a- uh, 958, last three digits, 958. Same thing, it's a net lab. That says computer and office study, so I don't know if that's directly related to instruction. Yes, this would be related to instruction, and it's to make sure that we have the license again in place um, July 1st. So a Got lot it. of these licenses, as you know, they renew each year, and we try to just uh, issue the purchase orders as they come through so that we can make sure that everything is up and running for the start of the school year. Got it, okay, on the same page, purchase order 952 for the summer 2017 Black College Tour for students, the $32,000, almost 33. Was there any cost to students for that? I do not believe so, but the, Greg, this is the Umoja project. Do you know the answer if there was a cost to students? I do not believe so. So what this what this purchase order is covering, um, it was 17 students, three chaperones, and it included the travel expense and meals for students and the chaperones. So it does not look like there was any cost outlay for students. Where is the where is that money coming from? Student equity? Got it. Thank you. And page seven. Purchase Order number 970, we bought light poles. It's not a big amount of money, $2,100 for May Avenue. Is that city property? So May Avenue is the fire road that um, bifurcates the PCC property. And um, it actually saves us money if we can buy the, the light poles from the city and so that way we own them and maintain them and then we can upgrade them or remove them as needed for the projects that are upcoming. Okay, I understand that. Is is May Avenue part is that that's a city street, right? 
So, I mean, I understand what you're saying, but I'm there, there's a there's a piece of it that's the entrance of it is the city street. The rest of it is is our property, but the light poles have always been the city's property, and so we're trying to get everything cleaned up um, on the corner with all the titles and, and everything and consolidating the titles, and again, this is one of the things that we needed to purchase from the city, um, so that way we can remove them um, if needed for the parking structure. Is So that's a benefit to us and... Yes. Not, okay. Yes. It just looks kind of weird for it to say that we're maintaining, you know, city property with our money. Well, the street is ours. The light pole just happened. It was one of those legacy things that have always been there um, before the before the street was given to the district. The light pole that wasn't part of the whole deal. <laughs> Got Especially it. Especially Malulu, that that was a regular street. The people could go yeah. through our campus on, and it was a it was a wonderful thing to have negotiated to get that be part of our property so that it reduced you know traffic going through the middle of campus. Got it. Got it. Okay, two more. Page nine. Um, in the middle, it's a uh, the last digit is a nine, eight three zeros and a nine. Capital projects fund one. Trucks and vans for a hundred thousand um, dollars. What is our current fleet of trucks and vans number? And you don't have to give me this number right now. And how many of them are available to be used by staff? The reason why this caught my attention is because there were a couple of times where I know that we wanted to use some of the district vans to transport students to field trips or competitions. And each time I called, they weren't available. We didn't have any. They were currently being used. One was in the shop. So I'm just wondering um, when faculty or staff or support staff needs to use these vans, how many of them are actually going to be available for them? I'm actually going to turn that over to Tim Wooten. He has that answer. Great. <laughs> yes, we have about eight vans right now. The, the leases on the vans are paid half by um, administrative service facilities and half by ASB. And yes, there is a high demand for those. Mm -hmm. um, athletics uh, can, uh, consistently books those uh, over 50% of the time. Um, so those are the only vehicles that we have that are available um, for um, the staff and faculty and, and students to use. The so eight vans. The other, I'm sorry, ahead. go ahead. The other vehicles are, are all work vehicles. The, what is the existing fleet available to faculty is it eight now or it's going to be eight it is eight now the vans and that's with the purchase of this uh those were uh um How not many vans were these? The, those are work vehicles they're basically they're so these are not for you know for use for students or faculty no the, those are trucks and um service uh, yes yeah, service vehicles so so the hundred thousand dollars it's still not going to alleviate the situation when faculty needs to use the equipment to transport students to activities. Uh, that's correct. No, the hundred thousand was just for the work vehicles. Okay. I personally drove students several times. You know, once to Fullerton, once to um, Malibu, and it's because I have a big car and students don't have cars. But I tried to rent vans and I couldn't. Are we doing anything to try to make more vehicles available? for faculty to be able to transport students? Well, uh, right now we know that we have a high demand for the eight. Um, so if we were to do something, um, we would have to go out and lease more vans and um, uh, identify funding for that. Okay. Trustee Malu, may I suggest that, that um, the team get a chance to uh, make a presentation later and have the, because I understand how would you know this off you know, the top of your head. I understand. Okay. No problem. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, the last item, I, I don't understand. The very last one on page nine, the enrollment assessment fee. Who is being assessed? The it, It's a small amount, $3,700, but I just don't understand what that is. You're talking about page uh, nine. Page nine, the very Not last one. Not the very last one, page nine. 
there's so many fees, enrollment, and I don't know who, who is being charged that and who is paying for that. Well, th this, would, this would be something that the district is paying for. So this isn't anything that's charged to the students. Um, but you have officially stumped me on this one. I don't have this one off the top of my I head. I apologize for that. And I'm gonna, I can get I'm the gonna answer look later. to Margie. Margie has no idea either. Okay, I apologize. We don't have that answer. That's but okay. But we can get that for you. Uh, if I could make a suggestion which I made a suggestion a couple of years ago, if you would let staff know ahead of time that you're gonna ask, ask these questions, it, it's really helpful because then, you know, I, I understand. It. Emily, if you knew every single one of these, I'd be really impressed. <laughs> no, I, I've tried I to do eight that. Eight out of nine. <laughs> yeah. I, you yeah, know you what, do. I've tried to do that. It's just, I've, I've been traveling. I just got back today and yeah. I was pressed for time. But yeah, if you can let me know what that is, that'd be great. Um, one last question on the, the purchase order listing, and I don't know if this is even possible or legal. Is there a way to do two separate purchase order reports? One of them that's just strictly district operations and one of them that's just strictly bonds for the bond measures and, and the bond money? Because in going through these, I see that, you know, a lot of these are, you know, operational costs, but then some of them are also bond money. And it would be really interesting to be able to have one purchase order report, board report, just for the bonds, and one for operations. I thought that was 5.15, right? I'm sorry? It, it could be done. It would require programming um, in order to, because that would be a special report that we would have to code and program. Um, so, you know, I think the fund number tells you yeah. we could put a legend on here maybe a little easier than programming an entirely new report that tells you what the fund number is. Maybe like a banner um, running down the bottom or something with the legend. Yeah, or we could, we could put the legend in the board item or in board docs of what uh, the fund numbers mean because anything that we add to this report will take programming. Yeah. Okay. Um, but I, th I think when, that's an excellent when suggestion. When we do, you know, the write-up for 5.10, we can put a little grid in there what the fund numbers mean. It's good enough to me. Thank okay. you. Okay. Um, I, along those lines, is it possible, and I'm not a computer person, uh, for Trustee Malalu to have sorted it via fund number, or is it a document that's that's permanent? No, this okay. is a, a PDF. Okay. It is, it so doesn't. then the legend makes the most uh, sense. I have just one question on um, uh, 5.10, and that is the third from the bottom on page 9, um, reimbursing the foundation $1,115 for um, tr travel to Washington, D.C. Um, the expense was more than that. And so is the other amount that is due the foundation going to be reimbursed? I believe that this is the reimbursement for the district employee. It's the airfare. So I, I don't know the answer to that. I do know that this um, was a, a the portion that the foundation paid for the district employee, and so that was the district funds are reimbursing. Well, for I'd that. like a, I'd like a report at the next meeting because it's more than this. Okay, all right. So, so could I have a motion to approve? So moved. Five point one. Second. Okay, okay. Uh, moved by Trustee Malaulu, seconded by Trustee Zia. This is five point one zero. Virginia Baxter. Aye. Jeff Kellogg. Aye. Vivian Malaulu. Aye. Doug Otto. Aye. Sunny Zia. Aye. And student trustee Chavez. Aye. Okay, 5.17. Okay, so. Please uh, make a motion and put it on the floor first. Oh, we put the motion first. <laughs> yes. Okay. May I have a motion? So moved. Okay, moved by Trustee Malaulu. Second. Uh, seconded Already by Trustee moved, Zia. See how easy this is going to be. Okay. Oh, they missed it. Okay, got it. Okay, so. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I wasn't up there. Thank you. <laughs> My partner over here. 
in crime. I would have said that, but. <laughs> so was I right or wrong? Do we have the motion before we have the discussion? Yes. Okay. Always. Okay. 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 So on 5.10, I have. No, no, you've already done 5. .1. I'm sorry, 5.17. I have a couple of questions, and they're all kind of about the same. Um, on page four, let me ask all the questions first, because I think they can probably all be in one answer. On page four, down at the bottom, for the upward bound, um, I see that there's a difference in hours per week and hourly rate, which is understandable, but there is no distinction in what the upward bound job category is or, or what the title is. So you got one person working 16 hours a week at $35 per hour, one person working 25 hours a week at $30 per hour, and then another person right underneath that working 25 hours a week at $25 an hour. And I would just like to, to know what the distinction is between those four upward bound jobs. But let me continue before, before that question gets answered. I just think that when you list John Doe upward bound, it should state you know, whatever the category is of, see how above that you've got, you, it says presenter, you've got interpreter, you've got interpreter four, interpreter five, but for presenter, you've got different rates being paid to different people. So that's one question. If you go to page five, you've got the job category of student assistant, $10.50 per hour. Down in the middle, you've got one person who is, making, who is working less hours than everybody else, upward bound. Everyone's working 20, this person's working 18 hours a week. And then on the next page, six, the exact same thing happens, but it's a different hourly rate, obviously student assistant too. So I'm just wondering why the upward bound rates are so inconsistent across this report. So that's my one question about upward bound. You've got a, a difference in rates and a difference in hours even though they're in the same category of their job assignment is the same category. Okay, and then, so that's one question. Do you guys want to answer that before I go to the next one? Uh, yes. Uh, if you look actually at the uh, salary schedule for presenters, there's about, I want to say about five or six different levels, and that's why you see different rates. Uh, so it, it depends, and I'd have to look at the job descriptions to see the distinctions, but each one for those particular rates are distinctive to each other. And, and I, I kind of assume that. Mm -hmm. It's just that right above that, you've got the, the distinctions in interpreter three, interpreter four, interpreter five, so, but it doesn't say that with the presenter. Um, so you're right, you're right. So maybe, maybe we could make that kind of just because right now they're all clumped together into presenter and you've got four presenters, but it doesn't say why one's making this much money or working that many hours. So maybe if we could say, you know, presenter one, presenter two, just so that the report is a little more um, consistent. Gotcha. I will review that. Trust okay. Me, Molly. Thank you. And the same thing for page five and page six. You've got the two upward bound people. I, that one it does say student assistant one and student assistant two it does say that mm -hmm. but why are they only getting 18 hours when everybody else is getting 20. You want to speak to that Greg? So the it's based on the budget and based on what they have for services you know they're running what you're seeing here is um, the positions that support the summer program the summer session and so it's there are, um, of course, a big portion of that happens at Whittier College, and we have two weeks here. So it just depends on the need of the program and what they've budgeted for those needs. Okay, got it. All right, and at the very bottom of page six, you've got one person, um, federal work study student assistant one at 1050 an hour, but it doesn't say how many hours per week this person is budgeted for. And the same thing on page seven. They, they get their $10.50 per hour, but it doesn't say how many hours per week they're budgeted. Anyone? Um, 
I believe that is because their, their hours are variable. It depends. Uh, it depends on uh, the <coughs> program's needs and it depends on the student's availability. But shouldn't there be a cap? Or, or is there no cap? Can they work 40 hours if they want? They could they during the to? summer. So, so it, it would be up to whatever or? But yeah, whatever the agreement is between the program manager and the student. Is, do we need to, obviously we don't need to because it's not here, but um, would it help if we specified, you know, between or, you know, undisclosed hours between 10 and 40 hours? If that helps you, we can certainly do that. Okay. Well, and it helps to know that there's no limit. Uh, well, for federal work study, they're limited to 16 to 20 hours. Okay. So maybe we can, you know, write that on there in parentheses, 16 to 20 hours. And lastly, this isn't a question, but I didn't realize that um, Jenny Duravage is leaving us. Yes. Where is she going? Dr. Peterson <laughs> wants to answer that. And that's probably not part of the no. board meeting. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so thank now you, everybody. We'll call for the question. Virginia Baxter. Aye. Jeff Kellogg. Uh, Vivian Malaulu. Aye. Doug Otto. Aye. Sunny Zia. Aye. Okay, um, 6.1 management uh, salary schedule. So moved. Okay, moved by Trustee Second. uh, Zia. Seconded by Trustee Malaulu. I would like to speak on that. And you're gonna speak. I'll intro it for you, yeah. To uh, intro this management salary schedule, I'm really delighted to bring you a management salary schedule proposal tonight that I am very confident in and support. Um, my understanding is that this began, work began on this in earnest about a year ago with Trustee Zia and Trustee Otto working very hard to come up with a plan that was equitable. And we do have uh, Vance Jacobson here from JP Reward Systems who also worked very hard on this with Rose Delgadio. So they deserve huge kudos for this plan that you are considering tonight. Uh, just to give you some of the highlights of the plan before you consider and discuss it, I wanna give you a, just a couple of touch points. Uh, the there's many benefits to this management plan. The first is that it provides equity for the full management team who previously did not receive longevity pay. Uh, the second item is it provides a continual path of compensation growth uh, that supports re retention and translates into less downtime and more time working toward our goal achievement. The third thing I'd like to highlight is it provides an attractive tool for recruitment purposes that's going to lead to enhanced pools of applicants for selection purposes. Uh, the fourth thing I'd like to highlight is it rewards individuals for years of experience in a position on a yearly basis as opposed to every five years or every 10 years for longevity resulting in individuals being rewarded sooner. And I'd also like to highlight that the district's effective conversion cost for this plan is 1.57%, which represents the COLA uh, that is provided in the state's current budget. Thank you. Are there any questions or comments? I, I'd just like to um, speak in favor of this motion. Um, and I, I think we're probably all in agreement um, based on our discussion in closed session. I, I would just like to say to everybody who has a vested interest in this that it's one of those things where on the surface it might not go over right away where people would look at it and think, yeah, right away. It's something that you have to really study and understand to really appreciate the value that it will have, not only for the district, but also for the management, the members of the management team, currently 113 members of the management team. It will have a lot of long-term good and a lot of long-term benefit. So just, it's not, it's not something that um, based on face value, you can rally behind and say, yeah, this is awesome because it doesn't look that way right away. And it took, a, it took a lot of questioning and research for us to understand the long-term positive effect that it will have. And thank you to the, the team and uh, Vance and you know, everybody who worked on it to be able to provide this information. Okay, before I call the question, I better read the motion, and that is that the Board of Trustees approve the management salary schedule as submitted. It was moved by Trustee Zia, seconded by Trustee Malaulu. Um, President oh, Baxter, sorry, yeah. may I just add um, just one point of clarification and information. Um, this is, uh, the, what is presented at the board docket and uh, is uploaded. 
um, just to make sure that uh, since the public has the right to know, there has been minor changes to the classifications, just a matter of titles um, that were um, changed. It was in the substantive change, it was a ministerial change, and I believe we have copies, is that right? It's out there um, for the public to see what those, um, it's in red lines, uh, so you could see, um, it's just a matter of the using the right uh, titles, so I just wanna speak to that, and then, um, I just want to thank Trustee Otto for your partnership and um, President Romali and Van Vance and, of course, Rose in supporting this effort. This has been a long time coming and will support equity for our management team. We didn't want to um, really shotgun this last year. Uh, we wanted to be deliberative, make sure we're doing proper analysis, and um, I want to commend Trustee Otto for his leadership in recognizing that and working um, together uh, so that we can bring you something that is fully thought out and um, has been um, fully baked essentially so that uh, we're, we're doing the right thing and people have opportunities to grow in our college district and not capped out and look elsewhere. So that's the hope and hopefully you'll support um, supported uh, as far as the district is concerned, the management. I'm sure you will. Thank you. Uh, Trustee Otto? Uh, just a couple of uh, very quick comments about this. I think that the system that we had was antiquated, that it did a disservice to our employees and did not create proper incentives. Um, the modern trend in this field is not to have five steps like we do, but to have many more steps so that people who come here can say, I can see where I go if I work hard and I stay here. And that's, and instead of having <coughs> our employees say, I've only got two and a half years left until I can get a, uh, uh, a longevity bonus, they can say, what can I do tomorrow to do my job here? And uh, I, I think that that's a significant uh, improvement. Historically, the way that these things came about was that um, colleges and schools <coughs> have, I think, we're, we're, we're part of a, of, a, of a growth of the human resources uh, area that, uh, that was never kind of was on the cutting edge of things. And I think with the able assistance of our consultant, um, Mr. Jacobson, we've been able to step back and say, what's the best thing for this college? What's the best thing for our students? What's the best thing for our employees going forward? And I think this achieves that. For example, uh, we will be going out for uh, some dean positions in the very, very near future. And if this passes, what we'll be able to do is to communicate to people that would apply for those jobs that this is what you can look forward to for 11 steps at Long Beach City College. Um, uh, I know at, Coast, at, at the Coast Community College District, they wanted to eliminate these longevity requirements, but they weren't quite able, <coughs> excuse me, to do it um, because of uh, sort of a vestigial uh, understanding of how important it was. They did it uh, more than, than had occurred in the past, but this is a very progressive, very, uh, well thought out approach and uh, that's why uh, I support it. And uh, I think that this is a step forward for how we do business at Long Beach City, City College. Okay, thank you. All right, Madam Secretary, please call the roll. Virginia Baxter. Aye. Jeff Kellogg. Aye. Vivian Malaulu. Aye. Doug Otto. Aye. And Sunny Zia. Aye. Okay, thank you. 6.2. Um, 2017-18 indefinite salary rates for district employees. Uh, the, the motion will be, it is recommended that in anticipation of any potential financial uncertainties, negotiations, legislation, or other factors that the governing board hereby declare that all salary rates be declared indefinite for fiscal year 2017-18 for academic employees represented by LBCCFA and CHI, classified employees represented by AFT, management team employees and other unrepresented employees as submitted. So, so could moved. I have a motion? So moved. Uh, Trustee Otto and seconded by Trustee Kellogg. Is there discussion?
Well, if there's not discussion, I, is this um, presented? It's an action item. Yes. And if you have no discussion, I'll take No, it. I was asking uh, Vice President Gable. Uh, Actually, uh, President um, yeah, oh, okay. Baxter, it's on my end. <laughs> okay. And I'm sorry, your question is? Well, my question is, uh, is this a normal procedure every yes. year? Okay. Yes. That's every all. year we bring this forward to the board. Okay. And every year it's approved and, and it's a necessity. Okay, very good. No, I just want, I, I was afraid that there was something in the offing that I wasn't aware of. I, I, I thought your question was, if there are no questions, can we still vote on it? <laughs> yeah, no. Okay, Madam Secretary, call the vote. Yes, Virginia Baxter. Aye. Jeff Kellogg. Aye. Vivian Malaulu. Aye. Doug Otto. Aye. Sunny Zia. Aye. Okay, it's passed. Uh, next, 6.3, resolution reduction of classified service. Um, it is recommended that the Board of Trustees adopt Resolution 062717A, Reduction of Classified Service as Submitted. Um, I need a motion. So moved. Okay, moved by Trustee Otto. Well, I'll second to, to oh. start the uh, discussion. Point, point it, of order, point of order, point of order. I have a question. So, but wait, don't we need to vote no, you need no, a motion no. on the floor, then you can make an amendment or yeah. something to the motion. The motion is on the existing resolution, I which know was amended. So I know that. we can't move on the resolution as is. We have to move on the resolution as amended. It hasn't been amended. It yet. hasn't been amended We're yet. We're trying to amend it amend here. It right? here? Yes. 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 And with, okay. So you need, the, you need the resolution on the floor. We need to have the motion. Yes, thank you. So we need we to have the motion it. so we can get it on the floor for discussion. Then we can't approve it if we're going to amend it. Sure, you can amend it. Yeah. We're not approving it. But the motion was to approve that resolution. Right, but then there could be a substitute motion. Sure. Yeah. <clears throat> we couldn't talk about it until it was on the floor. So there's a motion. Okay, the so there's the a motion on the floor. Uh, Is there a discussion? Yes. Yeah, I'll, you want me to start? Start. I'll start. It, there's a little bit of a pause because on this, this is uh, on a program that we're looking at. Uh, we're not able to uh, have the same funding we have in the past because there was a grant. There were grants, uh, multiple involved. We received one grant, but not both grants. So this resolution was looking at uh, to eliminate the entire program, and with the what I believe uh, some of us, all of us, are interested in doing is that to modify this to where uh, we can look at trying to maintain some of the program. Uh, did I fairly, yes, and, did and I fairly and get to that point so far? Yes. This is, and again, great. this is with, uh, uh, as on the resolution, this is with outward bound. Upward, upward bound. bound. Upward bound, upward <laughs> bound, outward bound. And uh, it is interesting, I know uh, in particular, I know Trustee Baxter, because they were they were housed or operated out of the foundation building at one time, so you probably would physically see them. But uh, this program is on our high school campuses uh, throughout the city of Long Beach in the past, uh, helping students. Uh, they are not our students directly, because you cannot do that. They're high school students, but they're helping those individuals mm -hmm. to prepare them, get them to college. There's programs involved. and. Uh, and ironically now the, the programs for the high schools, the ones that, the two high schools that now qualify, if you will, is that still qualifies, and I know this is ironic when you think about the city of Long Beach and our demographics and et cetera, but the two programs at Jordan High School and Cabrillo are still qualify to have these, the other ones do not. So what some of us are looking at, I think all of us, but I don't wanna, uh, we, we're concerned about losing the entire program. Uh, it has value, it's been successful. It's unfortunate that we did not get both grants, but um, the, for me personally, I would like to see us put together some way with the one grant to try to address the issues the best we can to at least make an effort. I know it's gonna be a challenge because of what we've been explained on staffing levels, et cetera, and the responsibilities, but um, I'll, I'll leave it open for the rest of my, my colleagues, but I would personally like to see us try to address the problem, focusing on the two schools that qualify, Cabrillo and Jordan High School, to continue the programs and to help those students. No one is arguing the fact that it has not been a successful program, uh, that it has had an impact, 
it's unfortunate we did not get the competitive grants, but we did get one. And how can we put that together? Again, it's a, uh, again, it is a five-year grant. Uh, so the, the, the thought that if we don't try to maintain it, then the programs, the entire program goes away throughout the, uh, all the high schools. The, the really, the, the, the chances of that ever coming back are probably gonna be much, uh, it'd be diminished. And so I think many, uh, I personally would like to see us at least make the attempt to maintain it where we can and see where it goes from there. Just a quick, just a quick point of clarification. Uh, we don't get to choose which high schools they're identified in the grant. There's three of them. Okay. Trustee Zia, would you like to try to amend the motion? Yes, I'd like uh, to make a substitute motion, President Baxter, but I need your help uh, because it's quite complex because um, we're changing the language. Um, Do you want to see if you can read my handwriting? I will certainly try. Right. Start with the word amend. Okay. Down at the bottom. Give it a shot there. I just looked at it. You should have been. A, you should have been a pharmacist. <laughs> um, so we're going to amend to um, remove uh, the one point zero FTE uh, or keep the one point zero FTE in the supervisor. Correct. Um, that's the first line item. Um, we're going to um, the the motion is to. Lay off 1.525 uh, FTE for um, the program specialist, if I understand correctly. You're doing great. And I um, think that's pretty much. Uh, did we decide to do? Did we discuss this, uh, keeping the 1.0 um, FTE in senior office assistant, or was it? Um, no, that that was reduced too. I think. Okay, it's not here. I think it was fixed. That's up the rows. That was kept, yeah, that's gonna to be determined. Okay, oh yes, okay, yeah. to be determined. The office assistant to be determined. The right. office of uh, senior Wait. office uh, assistant. Um, Trustee Z, I, I, I'm not good at lip reading. So, um, <laughs> uh, trust, uh, Vice President Gable, um, I believe it was a 0.52. Was it's a 5.2.5 uh, layoff, 5 FTE layoff for senior offices is, is what was uh, previously discussed. Okay. And, and okay, um, so it would be, let me just restate this. So the elimination um, would not be for the supervisor. So the way the resolution read is these position eliminated total percent of FTE eliminated in classification. So the first line item will be removed um, and we will keep the supervisor one, one FTE position and the second line item, which is 2FT in the classification of Upward Band Program Specialist, um, we're that, that is going to be determined by, uh, and you guys are going to come back and give us a report, is that correct? We will. And um, the last one, the 1FTE in the classification of Senior Office Assistant will be uh, changed to 1.52. It's a 52.5. So uh, zero senior point. Senior office assistant will be laid off at a 52.5 FTE. I'm sorry, 52, what, what do you mean? Five Z zero point five two five or 1.525? 52.5. Five five. Uh, yeah, 52 and a half percent. 52, okay, yeah. percent. This is, we're talking FTEs here. It says one FTE. Well, percent of an FTE. Okay, of so a full -time equivalent 50. Okay, employee. so did everybody get that resolution? Amendment. Uh, it looks like our secretary didn't. I'll repeat that. Okay. Okay. Are, are you making the motion? I'm making a substitute motion. Okay. So it's uh, moved by Trustee Zia, seconded by Trustee Kellogg. Sorry, Discussion? my handwriting so bad. Okay. Oh. Madam Sorry. Chair. So I'd like to speak in favor of the substitute motion. Yes. Uh, couple of things on this item um, this is this is probably the most difficult um, vote that I've had to make this first year um, I'd like to commend Vice President Peterson he did a great job of um, explaining the situation both the pros and cons of it 
and it just, um, it's not easy to cut programs or cut staff, and it's not easy to continue with them when they obviously pose challenges to the district. Um, we had a very lengthy discussion in closed session about this, um, and I'm going to concur with what Trustee Kellogg said as far as um, the high schools, you know, there's the, the two high schools that are still um, eligible to benefit from this upward round, bound program are both in our districts. Jordan High School is in Trustee Kellogg's district, Cabrillo High School is in my district. Regardless whether they're in our district or not, I would still vote in favor of this motion. I don't care where the high schools are located in the district. And, you know, the fact of the matter is we don't even know if these, any of these students who are being assisted by the Upward Bound program will even end up at Long Beach City College. They might not. They might go to a different community college or go to another four-year university. But that's not the point. The point is that we have the funding, even though it's, it's not the amount that we typically get. The fact that we have the funding and the fact that we do have some staff remaining and the fact that you know we've got the wherewithal to make it happen is what matters. And the fact that we have students in our districts that are eligible to me is a deciding factor. So as long as there are students there that can benefit from an existing program that is funded, we just have an obligation to make it work and we have to figure out how to make that happen and I know that it, you know, the challenge will fall on uh, Vice President Peterson and his staff and the district itself, but that's what we do. That's why we are Long Beach City College. That's what makes us special. And this is an opportunity for us to come back a year from now and say, you know, we made chicken soup out of chicken poop and we made it happen. And if one student benefits and comes through out of this program, then we've done our job. And that's why I'm speaking in favor of this motion. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. Uh, take the roll, please. Virginia Baxter. Aye. Joe Kellogg. Aye. Vivian Malaulu. Aye. Doug Otto. Aye. And Sunny Zia. Aye. Okay. 6.4 uh, employment contract that the Board of Trustees approve the employment contract and stipend for Elizabeth Orr, Interim Dean, Creative Arts and Applied Sciences, as submitted. And do I read the rest of this? Yes, please. The employment contract states, um, provides for a term of employment from June 12, 2017 through June 30, 2018. The contract provides for a monthly compensation of $10,884, health and welfare benefits, and life insurance. So moved. Okay, moved by Trustee Zia, seconded by Trustee Malaulu. Is there any discussion? I, I just wanted to, uh, President Baxter, sorry, I took the liberty of going without your permission. Um, I just wanted to congratulate uh, Lisa or Elizabeth or uh, on this opportunity. I think she's gonna do a fantastic job and um, I'm sure she's gonna make us very proud. Thank you. Um, uh, Lisa is a graduate of Long Beach City College and second generation employee and um, I, she was department head of uh, uh, history. This is interesting. Science. Since when is history applied sciences? <laughs> uh, that's what they call it now. Oh, okay. All right. She was department head of history of political science. So I was looking for that in here and, and I agree with Trustee Zia. Anyone else? Okay. Call for the question. Virginia Baxter. Aye. Jeff Kellogg. Aye. Vivian Malaulu. Aye. Doug Otto. Aye. And Sunny Zia. Aye. Okay. Uh, 7.1, course additions to general education plan A. I do not see the president of the academic senate here. Jeez. So who's going to take that? Uh, we are going to have, unfortunately, Karen Kane is ill this evening and really is very sad that she could not make it as it's her last meeting. Uh, so we have uh, Executive Vice President Luann Bynum who's going to fill in for her and read her report to you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, 7.1A is just course additions to Plan A for general education. 
patterns, you'll see the COM 25, um, we've added Plan A Social Sciences, COM 60, Plan A is Information Competency. So moved. Second. Uh, moved by Trustee Otto. Second. Seconded by Trustee Kellogg. Got questions? Virginia Baxter. Aye. Jeff Kellogg. Aye. Vivian Malaulu. Aye. Doug Otto. Aye. And Sunny Zia. Aye. And student trustee Chavez. Aye. Okay, 7.2 new and modified degrees uh, that the board approved the degrees effective spring 2018 as submitted. So moved. A move by okay. Trustee Otto. Second. Seconded by Trustee Kellogg. Vice President Bynum. Yes, unless you have any um, questions, the new Associate of Science degree is actually a new um, degree Associate Science Library Technician program designed to teach fundamental, fundamentals and knowledge of the skills needed for today's library technologists. There are some questions about why we are doing that when librarians need master's degree, but there's a lot of support that goes into that. It's also part of the Strong Workforce Program. It's one of the programs we established under Strong Workforce. It has to reflect current labor market needs and um, job openings in the community to be able to be accepted and approved for Strong Workforce. And I will second that. Um, this is a growing field mm -hmm. and I think it's wonderful. I wanna congratulate the Library Learning Resources area for uh, proposing this um, new major. Okay, uh, anybody else? Okay, Madam Secretary. Virginia Baxter. Aye. Jeff Kellogg. Aye. Vivian Malaulu. Aye. Doug Otto. Aye. And Sunny Zia. Aye. And student Trustee Chavez. Aye. Okay, 7.3, new modified and inactivated courses that the Board of Trustees approves the new modified and activated, inactivated courses effective fall 2018 as submitted. So moved. Okay, moved by Trustee Otto. Second. Uh, seconded by Trustee Kellogg, Vice President Bynum. Yes, these are, there's a number of actions in here. One that you might find of particular interest is, is uh, reducing the maximum size for our vocational nursing program. If you'll take a look at the list down there, uh, many of them go from 54 to 45. Um, this is a result, this number more accurately reflects the historical trend. Years ago, we put 54 in as a class size. Um, we want to tighten up the enrollment management process at the college and have that ac accurately reflect our enrollment outcomes. Um, we're trying to target a fill of 80%. Our cohorts are usually 30 to 40 per, um, per class. We do not turn any students away. So this is just cleaning up some of the issues we've had with this historical numbers that really don't reflect the reality of what's in the classroom today. Thank you. Any questions, comments? The question? Virginia Baxter. Aye. Jeff Kellogg. Aye. Vivian Malaulu. Aye. Doug Otto. Aye. Sunny Zia. Aye. And student trustee Chavez. Aye. Okay, 8.1 tentative budget for 2017-2018 that the Board uh, of Trustees approved the tentative budget for 2017-18 as submitted. So moved. Moved by trustee Zia. Second. Second by Trustee Kellogg. Uh, Vice President Gable, I assume you're going to make a wonderful presentation. Absolutely, I will try. Okay, so we have on the screen the, the, uh, the presentation. So I will cover the state budget overview. Now remember that the budget overview I'm covering is the May 15th, the May revise. So it's not the budget that was just signed today, it's what was in the May revise. And I'll try to notate some of the significant changes as I'm going through it, but um, I just wanted to, to put that up there. When we do the adopted budget, when that comes to you in September, that will reflect the final uh, signed budget. Um, we'll cover the strategic plan goals, the assumptions and highlights that the Budget Advisory Committee or BAC used to develop the budget, show the history and projection of our FTES, and then we'll go through um, the district funds, and then in detail we'll cover the unrestricted general fund along with some future budget challenges. So the state budget overview, there was $57.8 million uh, in growth funding provided, that represents a 1% statewide. 
we have budgeted zero for Long Beach City College, um, and it's likely that we will fall back into stabilization in 1718. There's 97 million for COLA, that's a 1.56% increase, which is $1.7 million for us. 183.6 million in a base allocation increase, which uh, was about 3.1 million for us. 5.6 million was provided to, for COLA for the categorical programs, the DSPS, the OPS, CalWORKs, and Child Care Tax Bailout, which represents about $58,000 overall for those programs in total. 135.8 million for deferred maintenance and instructional equipment. We say zero is budgeted in the tentative budget um, because at the time of the May revise, that funding was going to be held as a contingency until the end of the 1819 fiscal year. This is one of the line items that has changed significantly in the final um, approved and signed budget. So the dollar amount went down to $76.859 million. It will be allocated immediately. So we are estimated to get about $1.4 million and we will be splitting that 50-50 um, between deferred maintenance and instructional equipment um, as recommended by the Budget Advisory Committee on that. And that will, it does not appear in the tentative budget, but it will appear in the adopted budget. 46.5 million in Proposition 39, the Energy Efficiency and Renewable Generation Funding. So earlier you heard uh, Tim say that we already have the plans for the funding to do some LED uh, lighting retrofits um, in this building and a couple others. Um, we have been notified that we're going to get around 713,000, not the 841. The tentative budget shows the 841, but that will be decreased to 713,000 when we do the adopted budget. Uh, additional items that are in the state budget, $10 million for an online education initiative. Uh, this is the new system-wide learning management system that uh, is called Canvas. It is something that we are implementing here. We do have it live right now on a pilot basis, and it will be going live for all classes uh, in spring of 18. Can $20 million. You, can I ask you a real quick question? Mm -hmm. I don't want to talk about this, but... So they're trying to develop a distance learning program. In fact, 115th Community College in California. How does that, how, do we have any ideas about how that will affect our enrollment management? Good, good question. You know, it's really going to depend. Um, we don't offer that many online courses. Um, it's something that when you look at the success rates of the students taking an online course, they're typically lower than they are when they're taking the face-to-face -face course. Now, we are doing a lot within our instructional development um, and distance learning area to train faculty on how to teach in an online environment because it is very different and it is very time intensive. So, you know, those are two very different uh, ways to teach students. And we're also trying to develop courses for students to take before they sign up to see if they're really ready to take an online course. So we are trying to do things locally to help improve the success rates of the students. But it's really a faculty-driven initiative on whether or not we would increase the number of offerings that we have. Okay, so moving on, some of the other things that are in the state budget, $20 million for innovation awards. Again, this would be a grant process, so we don't know if we would receive anything. Um, we will make the decision when the request uh, for grants comes out on whether or not we will apply. Um, but it is something um, that we have typically applied for, not always successfully, um, but it is an opportunity out there. $5 million for full-time student success grants. Uh, we're estimating about $88,000 for uh, Long Beach City College. These grants would be administered and um, given out to students within the financial aid process, just oh. as they are now. $150 million for the Guided Pathways program. This is a new program. This is one-time funding. 
and the idea is to um, create guided pathways for the students. As the board knows, we were one of 20 college, colleges that were selected for the California Guided Pathways Project. This funding uh, will help provide funding for that project and support uh, for that, and it completely parallels everything that we'll be doing with the Guided Pathways Project and what we'll need to do with this new grant funding that's coming down the pipeline. Don't know how much we're gonna receive yet. Um, by the time we do the adopted budget, we will have that dollar amount and it will be in the budget at that point in time. Six million dollars for the integrated library system. Again, this is uh, to procure a statewide library system. Uh, so no, none of the funds would come directly to Long Beach City College. Um, as we're doing the budget, we're looking at what our strategic plan goals are. You know, here's a refresher of uh, these goals. The first, to innovate, to achieve equitable student success, to accelerate college readiness, build a community, and invest in people and support structures for transformation. Based upon our planning process that goes on uh, throughout the year, we develop an institutional priority. So. Every department and division within the college prepares a um, program plan, and then those are synthesized and developed into a division, um, a, a broader division or school plan, which is then incorporated into the vice, um, vice president level plans. Based upon those vice president level plans, those are reviewed and discussed at the college planning committee, and looking at all the goals from all the various areas, we created this institutional priority, as you see here. So, um, you know, really the, the main parts of that is uh, we want to create guided pathways and roadmaps. We want to maintain our fiscal viability. Uh, we want to expand our profile within the community to enhance our enrollment. And then lastly, we want to support equitable student success through innovation. So the, the next couple slides here, this is an attempt to take some of the um, augmentations or even some of the grant funding and some of the things that we're doing with the budget to show how they match up with one of the four strategic plan goals or one of the four institutional priorities. So I won't go over these in detail, um, but if the board has questions on this listing later, please feel free to um, ask me that. Okay, so some of the budget assumption highlights. Um, and this, is, again, this is developed by the Budget Advisory Committee. That's what BAC stands for. And you know, since um, we continue to have a deficit budget, the main overarching assumption is that we may be doing budget redirections um, in response to the budget impact or the priorities that are established by the college planning committee. So we haven't said that we're, we're cutting anything and we haven't cut any uh, departmental budgets at this point in time, um, but we have shifted some of the funding from one area to the other to, um, in order to provide the support for the, the areas that we're prioritizing for the next fiscal year. The FTS funded uh, target is 20,775. So that's the same target that we're trying to reach in the current fiscal year. So we're not projecting any growth. We have put in a half percent deficit factor um, in the, the case that we have a shortfall of apportionment revenues. So remember the deficit factor is something that is applied by the chancellor's office. We have no control over it and it gets applied um, in instances where on a statewide basis, either the enrollment fees or the property taxes do not come in at the level that the state budgeted for them. So rather than um, increasing our apportionment for that offset in enrollment fees and property taxes, they just cut the amount of apportionment that they provide to the state. So we are budgeting a half a percent for that. Um, again, we're trying to adopt the total cost of ownership um, principle, which basically says if you buy a piece of equipment, are there any maintenance agreements tied to that equipment or anything else? And if so, 
we're looking at that before we actually purchase the item to make sure that we can afford it on an ongoing basis. We um, are maintaining a 5.5% minimum unrestricted reserve. Um, as you know, a couple years ago, we're now required to develop an institutional effectiveness fund balance goal. So that was set at 15% um, for our long-term fund balance goal, and the short-term goal was set at 25, or 25, sorry, 12.5%. We have a load banking and vacation liability reserve of $2.8 million. Um, some of the benefit cost changes, you see that our benefits uh, continue to increase uh, pretty substantially um, each fiscal year. STRS increased by 1.85%, which costs us about $936,000. PERS increased this year by 1.643%, which costs $538,000. And then our health and welfare premiums increased by 3.2% uh, for a cost of 576000 Our retiree benefits, the amount that we're required uh, to contribute towards those remains at $5.1 million right now. We are in the process of having an updated actuarial study. Um, and so as soon as that gets done, we'll be incorporating that new number into our future projections. So moving on to the FTS history and projection, you can see here that um, between 11, 12, and um, 14, 15, we were on an up, upward trend in increasing our FTS. So you know that was kind of the tail end of the recession. In 13, 14, we started coming out of the recession. Um, in 14, 15. That was uh, the last year that we were able to make up all of the FTES that we lost during the recession. So you see we took advantage of that, uh, which forced us into stabilization in the 15-16 year. So you see that we dropped down to the 19,077 FTES in 15-16. This year in 16-17, we are restoring. We're trying to get back to our base level from 1415 of the 20,775, and uh, we're projecting no growth in the 17-18 year. So um, we are projecting to be flat um, next year based upon what we have this year. We do have an opportunity uh, this year when we file our final FTES report to try to capture some growth funding. So I think it's going to be something that we're going to be looking at the pros and cons of that. Um, do we want to utilize more of our summer FTES this year in our 16-17 to capture some of the growth funding that's available knowing that next year in 17-18, we're more than likely going to go into stabilization again. We're not going to meet that 20,775 FTES target. So it's a strategy that um, President uh, Ramali and I are looking at. We'll be discussing it with the President's Cabinet and kind of seeing what we want to do. But um, that will be done very shortly because our 320, which is the report that we use to report our FTES, is due on July 15th. So we'll be looking at that in the next couple weeks. Okay, so moving on to the list of funds, um, we have 11 total funds, and they are all listed here. Um, and as you can see, what we've listed here are the expenditures and other outgo showing you what was in the adopted budget for 1617, what we're estimating to end the current fiscal year with, and then the tentative budget for 1718. Uh, some of the major changes there, the unrestricted general fund, you know, it looks like there's about a, a $10 million increase between what we're estimating to spend this year and what we're budgeting for next year. 7.6 million of that is related to salary and benefit increases and about $3 million is a carryover for our business process reviews. The other, um, I would say, significant change that you see on the Capital Projects Fund, um, we're going from spending $7.4 million this year to a budget of nine point seven. million. As we've mentioned tonight, um, we have scheduled maintenance carryover 
that is in there as well as the new funding for the m and n building uh, that we got funded for. Looking at the general obligation bond funds, we have the two funds, Measure E and Measure LB. You see that uh, we're estimating to spend about $25 million between the two funds this year, and what we've budgeted is the remaining allocation of both of those bonds, and so that's why you see that large. We always budget the entire authorization of the bonds, um, and so that's why you see that, that large increase. And then lastly, on the VET Stadium operations, you see a decrease of about $900,000 between what we spent, the $2.2 million we spent this year, and we're budgeting $1.3 million, and that was because we did the stadium resurfacing in 1617 that we won't have that expenditure again in 1718. So moving on to the unrestricted general fund, again, here's the... Um, the, the high level summary, we have our revenues and other financing sources. We're estimating that we will receive $124.4 million. We're budgeting to receive $126.9 million for an increase in revenue of just under $2.5 million. On the expenditure side, we are estimating that we will spend $127.6 million this year. And then the tentative budget, we're estimating $137.7 million for a $10 million increase. And later we'll go into the details of that. So for the surplus or deficit, for the current year, we are estimating a deficit of about $3.1 million. The budget year, a deficit of $10.7 million. So for our estimated actual ending fund balance at June 30 of 2017, we're estimating that at 25.1 million, which is about a 19.7% ending fund balance. In our budget year, the tentative budget, we're budgeting 14.4 million, which brings that down to about a 10.5% ending fund balance. So moving into the revenue, um, further details of revenue, uh, you see there's no change. We get about $78,000 in federal revenue that comes into the unrestricted general fund. The apportionment obviously is the largest piece and the apportionment is based upon the FTES we generate. So we're estimating we're gonna receive $112.6 million this year and next year we're budgeting 116.9 million for an increase of about 4.2 million. Again, that is due to the 1.7 million we're getting in COLA, the 3.2 million that we're getting in the base increase, um, as well as offset by the deficit factor. Yes, Trustee no, Otto. I, I, I see the, the, what, we, what we might have next year <laughs> but given what I know about what we anticipate what's going to happen to CalPERS and STRS and candidates, can you have, do you have a three-year projection? Because uh, I think the, uh, I'm trying to remember who, who wrote the poem about the smiling mortician, but. Uh, <laughs> I, um, we, we have done a three-year projection and it gets really, really ugly. You will see later in the presentation that you know we're projecting 1718. We've also shown the projection for 1819, and even 1819 is ugly. And so to go beyond 1819 at this point, it was even worse. But we'll cover that, and you'll you'll see what um, our projections are based upon uh, the just exactly that the stirs and purs increases as well as our our salary increases due to step and column and everything else so it's not a deficit it's a structural deficit correct correct uh, vice president gable at what point does it become a fund balance deficit do you recall that would be in 1920 so in in 1819 you'll see we're we're budgeting about a six and a half percent ending fund balance what brings it down to 4.72 in 1819, it would be a deficited fund balance. Okay, thanks. That's why I said it was ugly. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, here's what I just explained about the uh, changes in the revenues. And then here on this slide, this is just a graphic picture that really um, 
I would say exasperates or, or really shows that we are so reliant upon our FTES. 92% of our funding comes from state apportionment. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we are really tied to the state budget. We are really tied to uh, trying to generate our FTES. And when that doesn't happen, it does really, really does hurt us. Anne Marie, can you yes. go back, please? Yep. Um, I know you've explained this to me numerous times, but perhaps you can refresh my memory of what those other sources are, if you can speak to that, the other sources of revenue. So the other sources are primarily uh, transfers in from other funds. So when we're moving money from one fund to the next, but I can look at the exact even the other local and other state revenues? So the other local, I thought you were just referring to the sliver that's titled other sources. So other sources um, are coming from the other funds. You know, the biggest piece of that other source is the uh, rent from the Los Coyotes property. That's about 320000 uh, that comes in. Other local money, what uh, is made up in that sliver is primarily... Um, international student fees and non-resident fees, as well as interest income, um, are probably the, the biggest slivers uh, from that. The other state revenue is our mandated cost uh, money, the state lottery money. Um, those are kind of the, the big ones coming from there. Okay, it's lumped into, well, what's the mandatory again? I'm sorry, what was your question? I didn't hear you. Uh, what was the mandatory portion of it? Did you just say mandatory as far as other? Oh, the mandated cost. Mandated cost. Revenue. What? That falls under the other state revenue. And so what, what, it, what is mandated cost? Mandated cost, that's the reimbursement that we get for the state for the various um, reports and processes that we're required to do. So the biggest one is collective bargaining. So since collective bargaining was legislation that passed that forced all districts to collectively bargain with their unions, it created what's called a mandated cost. So anytime the legislature passes a law that requires a district to do something that they don't typically do, it's considered a mandated cost and the state is supposed to reimburse districts for the time associated with implementing those laws. Um, we know that the state doesn't always uh, reimburse everybody for those. What they've been doing the past few years is just creating a block grant and saying we're just gonna pay you on an FTES basis and you don't have to file your claims and we won't audit your claims for that, so. And the lottery portion, how, what percentage is that? Is that of the 5.25. The lottery is about a third of the total other state revenue. Uh, we're budgeting $2.8 million for lottery and the unrestricted fund. Is that assuming, is that assuming we win the lottery? I no. <laughs> no, it does not. <laughs> but anytime there's a big jackpot, it does increase the lottery sales and increases the amount that we get. So. Is that so? Th that's two point two percent according to my calculations. Is that two point eight? You said out of one one sixteen million or one seventeen million? Correct. Is that right? Okay, Correct. I got you. about that. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Uh -huh. Okay, so moving on to the expenditure summary, um, academic salaries. We are projecting that to increase by about two and a half million. So this year we think that we're going to spend fifty one point five million. We're budgeting 54 million. The reason for the two and a half million dollar increase is that we hired 28 new faculty. There's one new management um, position in there as well. On the classified salary side, we're projecting to spend 26.3 million. We're budgeting 27.5 million for an increase of about 1.2 million. That increase is, um, one, we have restored four positions and created two new classified positions, um, but primarily it's due to vacancies that occurred throughout the year. So when we do the budget, we budget that the positions, all the positions that have been funded are gonna be filled 100% of the time, 12 months out of the year. 
That really does not happen with our classified staff due to the turnover, so we do have budget uh, savings each year, and that's why you're seeing that large increase um, there from the estimated actual to the tentative budget. On the benefit side, uh, again, we're projecting to spend 34.2 million, and we have budgeted 38 million for an increase of about 3.9 million. As I mentioned earlier, the STRS is going up about 936,000, PERS is going up 538,000, and our health and welfare benefits are going up 576,000. Also, benefits are a function of salary, so when your salaries go up, your benefits go up as well. It's like about 10 percent? 10 percent? In Going up 10 percent? About that, yes. Okay. Um, the other uh, large line item there, services, where we're projecting to spend 10.9 million, and we're budgeting 14.1 million for an increase of about 3.1 million. That's primarily due to the carryover of the business process review. So as you um, are all well aware, two years ago, we allocated a significant amount of money for the business process reviews. Uh, we are still spending that money. We are still working on those processes. And so we've carried over what hasn't been spent. Just so you know, at our next board meeting in July, we will be getting an update on uh, where we are with the BPRs as well as kind of all of the IITS um, information technology services initiatives that are underway right now just to give the board an update from that area. On the capital outlay side, uh, we're projecting to spend uh, 2.1 million and we're budgeting 1.6 million for a decrease of about $464,000. That was one-time money that was allocated in 1617 that is not carrying over. So here is the pie chart that breaks down our expenditures and kind of shows um, what percentage we're, we're spending on each category of expenditures. And you see there that overall for salaries and benefits, within the budget, that represents 86.9% of our budget is tied to our salaries and benefits. When we look at the one-time expenses, so basically, you know, the, the $4 million of one-time expenditures that are allocated in the budget, and if you take out those one-time expenditures, our salary and benefit uh, percentage goes up to 89.4%, um, which makes it more difficult to make cuts um, in order to reduce our expenditures in the future. Here's the seven-year trend that uh, we just uh, kind of show where it gives you the seven-year trend of the salary and benefits as a percentage. That was what the pie charts that we were just looking at. Um, you can see that we kind of hover around the 89%. Um, and 13-14 was the lowest year at um, 85%. And that was after we had gone through significant cuts. Our surplus and deficits, um, those have fluctuated. We, you know, in this seven-year trend, we have three years of deficit spending, four years of surplus spending. And then you can see there the changes to the ending fund balance and then the ending balance as a percentage of total expenditures. So here is the two-year projection that I was referring to. So the projected 1718, that is that reflects all the numbers that we just went over where we showed that we're projecting we're going to end the next fiscal year with 14.4 million ending fund balance or about 10.47% um, of expenditures. So the way we do the projection into the 1819 is we have a rollover budget. So we assume that we're going to spend and receive, uh, we're going to spend the same amount of expenditures, we're going to receive the same amount of revenues. What this chart on the right-hand side is reflecting are the known changes that, or I guess known at this point in time, of changes. So on the apportionment changes, you see that we're projecting we'll receive an additional $2.5 million in 1819 which reflects a 2.15% COLA 
That's the projection that comes from school services, so we've added that in. And then with our salary rate changes, we have negotiated the multi-year de deal with uh, CHI, our part-time faculty. And so we know that in 1819, we will be implementing a 2% increase to their salary schedule. That cost is estimated at $392,000. And then the other salary and benefit changes, these are really just our step and column. So that $3.9 million that you see there is made up of 1.3 million for step and column, health and welfare increases of 870,000, PERS increases of 842,000, and STRS increases of 936,000. So about, um, 4% increase in our expenditures each year just based upon our current salary schedules and benefits tied to those salary schedules. Other expense changes, you see this is to the positive, and so this is assuming that we spend all of the one-time money for the BPRs and the mandated cost carryover. Um, it is also, um, showing that we will not have an election expense in 1819 and we are not projecting at this point in time to hire any new faculty for 1819 so we'll have a savings on outfitting those offices so overall in 1819 we are projecting a deficit of about 7.9 million dollars which would bring our ending fund balance down to the 6,486,000 that you see there, or 4.72%, which is below the board policy amount of 5.5%. Um, so I think looking at this projection is one of our future budget challenges to where we are gonna need to start reducing our expenditures or growing our FTES, or really a combination of both, in order to address the structural deficit that we do have um, with our expenditures. So um, we also have the BOG waiver eligibility, the new guidelines, so we have the, the stricter eligibility requirements, which um, unfortunately could reduce our enrollment even further, when students find out that they aren't eligible for classes, they may decide not to take classes. Um, you know, what we hope is if they decide not to come here, then the, the students that are at Cerritos or Harbor decide not to go there and then they wanna come here because the, <laughs> the BOG waiver eligibility requirements don't follow you from college to college. It's just for your specific college, so if you, if you lose eligibility here, you can go to a, another local college and, and still get your fees waived and vice versa. Um, so, you know, we've mentioned already the state pension obligations. Those are continuing to go up. So you can see here um, that the STRS in the 22-23 fiscal year will be 20.25%. PERS will be at 27.3%. 30% in 24-25. So these are going up substantially each year for the next few years. Um, again, we have our retiree benefit obligation that we continue to monitor and watch every two years. We have the new actuarial study done. Um, and as I mentioned, we're in the process of getting that done right now. Here is just the, the grid year by year, how much the STRS and PERS rates are going to be. Um, so you can see over the next seven, eight years, you know, we have an increase in our expenditures of over $8 million just for our STRS and PERS um, liability. And this is assuming our salaries don't change. So this is based upon the salaries that exist today. Um, so as our salaries go up, these dollar amounts go up as well. Um, you know, I've kind of already covered the deficit spending. You know, our structural deficit um, is about 6.7 million, um, even though 
the tentative budget is over 10 million, as I said, four million of that is one-time funding. So at this point in time, we have a structural deficit of about $6.7 million that we're going to need to address. Um, and we will be working with our budget advisory committee this current fiscal year to look at ways to try to reduce our expenditures for the 1819 uh, fiscal year going forward. So that kind of concludes my presentation. I'll open it up to any questions that anyone may have. What was good in this budget <laughs> that you presented to us? <laughs> well, I, I think it was fantastic that we got 183.6 million in the base revenue increase because that was $3.1 million. So, and that did not exist in the January budget. That came through at May Revise. So, you know, when I was first looking at the budget, we had over a $13 million deficit. So I would say it's good that we got the base revenue increase. So if this um, was a heavyweight fight, uh, <laughs> it would have been called in the fourth round instead of the third round, the way you just presented everything. <laughs> I, I, I don't really have any questions, except um, I've been through enough budget cycles to know, but my concern is that during this presentation, um, you brought up, which to me is a little bit of the fantasy of the, our world, is that we either increase our, our revenue, which is our FTES, which we've already said we're in stabilization. We're gonna have to figure out a way to do better. That's tied into our enrollment management. So the expectations for our revenue to increase, I think is limited just by what I heard here tonight uh, that's coupled with the fact or we reduce expenditures and since we're in the business of people our expenditures are people and that's labor negotiations and we're coming into those and I've never once can really remember sitting through where we, we've had the type of reductions in that area to really make it make a difference and then the final one is when you and I was, there's certain numbers, when you say we're now bumping up at 89%, and that's just some people in the public, it, it may have gone through them, but that is frightening to me frightening. because the, the old rule of thumb used to be the threshold was once that number got into the 90 percentile, you were acting like City College of San Francisco. Mm -hmm. um, there are colleges that are they're very different. Uh, they're usually in a more rural area, but they could be down the lower 80 percentile. So that's why, I mean, this is one of those reality checks with uh, with PERS and STIRS, with our revenue, with stabilization, our enrollment management. I, I don't know how much we're going to borrow from, quote unquote, borrow from the summer, but I'm sure we're probably going to borrow a lot. That will get us to the point where at least we're, we're not, we're, we, we can address certain issues and then go back into stabilization, which is not an unusual process. but. Um, that was that was a that was a cold water presentation as far as I was concerned. I mean, that, that was the coldest of showers I've had in a while, and uh, it's it's harsh because I know what we're coming into um, with other factors, and so um, I don't know. I, that's why I asked you at least give me something to to look good on. But uh, and and this isn't the first; it won't be the last. But um, I will only say this is that I'm always concerned about what does get cut. In the past, it's always fallen on a lot of things directly tied to our students as far as student activities, things like that. Um, so I, I hope we don't get there. I hope that we have an enrollment management plan that gives us some direction and that can help us with the increasing our revenue. But that's, it's going to be tough. So thank you, I think. Yes. Oh, President uh, Romali. Uh, yeah, I, you're right, Trustee Kellogg. This is uh, freezing cold water in the face. Um, I have some. I have a lot of concerns, but I have some suggestions and a challenge to myself and the rest of us and the rest of the team. Um, here are a lot of my concerns. First of all, repeated deficit spending is not the best way to do business. So I'm going to particularly if it leads to a fund balance balance deficit in very short order. Um, so I'm going to challenge us that by the adopted budget that we have a plan in place to address this. 
Um, I'm particularly concerned, I want to echo Trustee Kellogg's, I have worked at institutions where the spending is 89% uh, salaries. This is not, these are not effective institutions that we would look to as benchmark institutions. And what it does is it limits our ability to execute on the things that are important to us, which is that strategic plan for students and taking care of our employees. So I'm gonna challenge us to look very carefully at that and see how we can shape that. We have to take a cold look at enrollment management and a borrowing and an FTES strategy. Uh, there are things coming down in the news every day that challenge us and provide, if you're gonna do a SWOT analysis, they would be considered threats, even though that is, uh, you know, kind of harsh language. Um, they are threats to us being successful in enrollment strategy. We need to understand what they are and have a strategy for how we're gonna get around that. Um, we have a strategic plan which executes on student needs and we have to leave enough money available to do that because at the end of the day that is our job. We have increasing costs uh, per STRS are just e examples. So what I want to do is, is challenge us by the adopted budget. We certainly will not be able to solve all the problems but to, I really, to really start coming up with how we're going to solve those problems and that we can be well on the way of execution of solving those problems um, by the adopted budget. And I also just want to say uh, that Amory and her team did an amazing job with what they, with, with the cold water that they've been given, they could not have done a better job. So uh, I challenge myself and I know that you're supportive of us and the whole team. I think this is where we need to start uh, figuring out how we resolve those issues. Okay, thank you, President Romali. Trustee Zia. Thank you, uh, Superintendent President, um, Dr. Romali. Um, it's definitely refreshing to see someone who is so proactive and doesn't get defensive. It's uh, definitely nice uh, and a great collaboration with our Vice President um, Gable, which I'm very proud of her work and her team's work. Um, on page 21, um, is there any way we can look at, the, I mean, these services are just killing us, this 3.114 million is there any way we look at, I, I know we have the uh, conventional revenue sources and um, conventional pathways of really um, looking at enrollment management, but perhaps we can look at how we can streamline some of our contracting services so that um, expenditures, I mean, we've got to change, it's about three million, over $3 million increase. So from 10, almost 11 million to 14 million What's that? Four I, oh no, four I said four good point. Okay, <laughs> four point one. <laughs> I thought you meant fourteen point one. <laughs> um, so, and is that possible for us to look at? Absolutely, I'm writing down all any and all suggestions. Yeah, yeah and, and I think that is something that we can look at. It's something that we have been looking at. I mean, we a lot of the the services are in software licensing. And so we have been moving more to looking at a district-wide site license rather than it being piecemeal by, you know, every department trying to buy a license. And so we have, um, you know, seen some cost savings. I won't say significant because every year your software goes up. You know, I don't care what software company it is, they raise their rates every year. And so it's always an ongoing battle. You know, the, the biggest reason for that $3 million increase is a carryover of unspent funds that we have set aside for the business process reviews. So, um, you know, that I think it's something that we are committed to doing, um, at least at this point in time. You know, we have done the financial aid business process review. We've done the academic services. We've touched on the purchasing. We want to uh, delve more into the enrollment services side, and that's kind of what we were planning on doing in the 17-18 year. Um, we were looking at doing uh, some work with um, human resources, payroll, and benefits administration. So those are the, some of the things that we really wanted to try to, to touch on in the current, in the 17-18 fiscal year with some of that $3 million that is being carried over. May I piggyback on that, that question, um, Vice President Gable? What financial benefit has been uh, gained by this business process service? 
Is that is that the wrong way to? No, I, and it, it's a good question, but I just don't think it's anything that we can really put a number to because what it's doing, um, yes, it has cost us money to change some of the coding within PeopleSoft, to change some of the processes within PeopleSoft, but really the benefits come on the student side uh, that students are seeing some of those benefits as well as some of our staff to where they're how, not. How do you know that? How do you know students are benefiting? Well, for one, you know, one of the first things that we did is we went to CCC Apply, um, which, so we changed our application process entirely, um, which now students, if they apply here, then their application is good for all oh. 113 colleges. Okay. Um, you know, the other thing that we did is we got rid of the form that was required for students to repeat a course. So there are certain courses that are allowed to be repeated based upon the grades that you got or if it's, you know, the type of course that it is. If a student wanted to repeat a course, we made them fill out a form and stand in line and have enrollment services sign off on that before they could register for it. We've now automated that within the system. So the system knows which courses are allowed to be repeated and it will automatically allow the student to register for that. So those are just a couple things. Okay, thank um, you. But next month when Sylvia is doing the update, <laughs> she can go into more detail. Okay, I thank you. I, I just uh, wanted to, no, 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 that's a, uh, you know, do you, uh, that was a question I had, and just to dovetail on that point, um, I've always wondered, you know, in the audit world, we have what we call post-mortem analysis, so looking at the effectiveness of a program, perhaps, I'm sure you've already thought about it, um, President Romali and Vice President Gable, but perhaps we could look at the value we're getting, um, you know, afterwards, or just uh, monetizing it in, in a way that we could say, look, in a tangible manner, that look, the, the money we're spending, we're getting a return on our investment. That's been challenging for me personally when I see line items on the budget. That is it is it directly benefiting our students? It sounds like it is. And are there other alternatives that we can perhaps? look at perhaps transfer of knowledge or having in-house folks uh, um, be able to do some of this work uh, instead of contracting out and then essentially, you know, I'm not saying that this is happening, but over relying on that I I knowledge that we uh, may build institutionally for a consultant. Um, I'm d those are some of the th touch points that are uh, of particular interest to me because I want to see the value work getting for the district with the dollars that we're spending, $14 million is quite something. I'm certainly in the wrong business, but um, it's just something to consider if we can look at uh, some type of a post-mortem analysis, um, maybe real time it could be done. Well, I think it's something that we can definitely attempt to do. You know, I'm kind of thinking through how would we do that. So, you know, maybe working with Vice President Peterson and his staff, they can look at, well, how many uh, repeat forms did they collect in a fiscal year and how many minutes did it take each staff time to process that form, kind of multiply that out by their hourly rate and then you would see, you know, th that could be. And how um, is it helping our um, FTEs, increasing FTEs? Those are some of the things that I'm particularly interested in. In, in my mind, that would be a good return on investment. If all this money that we're investing, essentially we're getting Increased FTE and enrollment. Um, that, sorry, I interrupted you. Just no, that's okay. had to bake that in. <laughs> yeah, we'll take okay. a look at it. Well, absolutely, I've got that written down. We'll take a look if it's monetizable. We'll take a look at if it's not and it's simply a value proposition for the students, or it leads to increased FTEs or something like that. We'll be able to give you the details of what the benefit. Sure. What the benefit? It could be is. qualitative, but it would just be nice to see what those mm -hmm. translate to. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. <laughs> so now we have to uh, we have a motion on the floor to um, approve the tentative budget. Uh, was moved by Trustee Zia, seconded by Trustee Kellogg. Virginia Baxter. Aye. Jeff Kellogg. Aye. Vivian Malaulu. Aye. Doug Otto. 
Pass the soap. Sunny Zia? Aye. And student trustee Chavez? Aye. Okay. And Board President Baxter, if I may, I, I sure. failed to thank uh, Mr. John Thompson, our Director of Fiscal Services, who is in the audience. You know, him and his team, uh, specifically Sam Chow, are really the ones that put their heart and soul into creating this document, so I really want to thank them for that. Yes, thank you very much, John and Sam. <laughs> thank you for saying that. Okay, 8.2, Education Protection Account Funding and Expenditures. This is an action item of the Board of Trustees approved the use of the estimated 16 uh, 0.8 million of education protection account proceeds resulting from the passage of Prop 30 and 55 to partially fund instructional salaries and benefits for the 2017-2018 fiscal year as submitted. So, so moved. moved. Okay, I, I heard Trustee Otto first, Second. seconded by Trustee Zia. Is there any question? Okay, a call for the Baxter. question. Virginia Baxter. Aye. Jeff Kellogg. Aye. Vivian Malaulu. Aye. Doug Otto. Aye. Sunny Zia. Aye. Student Trustee Chavez. Aye. Okay, 8.3 resolution liability and workman's comp uh, coverage for volunteers that the Board of Trustees adopt resolution 062717B, adopting and declaring for the purposes of workman's compensation and liability insurance that persons authorized to perform volunteer services shall be deemed an employee of the district. Could I have a motion? So moved. Second. Moved by Trustee Otto, seconded by Trustee Zia. Uh, yes, uh, Trustee uh, Kellogg. No, just uh, I'm reading there. It's when it, it sounds when the description on this, but at the end of the day, it's the uh, the state legislature has seen fit to allow school districts to qualify. So we're just doing something that we're. This and isn't anything. We're, yeah. yeah, we're mandated to do this. So away we go. Okay. Anyone else? We'll call for the question. Virginia Baxter. Aye. Jeff Kellogg? Aye. Vivian Malaulu? Aye. Doug Otto? Aye. Sunny Zia? Aye. And Student Trustee Chavez? Aye. A 6.4 resolution agreement with California Department of Education for child care. So moved. Uh, okay, moved. Okay. <laughs> but I didn't read it, that the Board of Trustees adopt resolution. I, I had read it. Okay, <laughs> so moved by Trustee Kellogg? Second. Seconded by Trustee Zia. Any questions? Big, uh, Virginia Baxter. Aye. I'm getting sleepy. Jeff Kellogg. Aye. Vivian Malaulu. Aye. Doug Otto. Aye. Sunny Zia. Aye. And Student Trustee Chavez. Aye. 8.5 Resolution Agreement with California Department of Education State Preschool Program. May I have a motion? So moved. Uh, oh, you got fast. <laughs> uh, moved by Trustee Zia. Second. Which a second by Trustee Malaulu. Are there any comments, questions? Okay, call for the vote. Virginia Baxter. Aye. Jeff Kellogg. Aye. Vivian Malaulu. Aye. Doug Otto. Aye. Sunny Zia. Aye. And Student Trustee Chavez. Aye. 8.6, five-year construction plan for 2019-33, uh, 23. Um, may I have a motion? I'll move. Okay, moved by Trustee Kellogg, tr seconded by Trustee Zia. And I, Trustee Kellogg, would you like to ask a question or make a comment? I just, I, only because we've had the facility master plan was before this, and when people talk to us, and I know it's, I was having this conversation with a student trustee uh, earlier, is that it's really hard for a lot of people, and, and that's our challenge, is to how we can explain to the public how we do things, especially when we're dealing with facilities. We had a facility master plan. Now we have the five-year construction plan. All of these things are parts of and to the general public many times, understandably, it can be very confusing. But from our standpoint, this is how, how process driven this entire, all of this is. And here's a classic, another, another part that's required that we do a five year, and then right behind this, we're gonna do another one that I won't say the same thing. We have the IPPs, the FPPs. Well, that's all part of fusion. And I mean, this is where you get into, even for trustees, it can be challenging. But the point is that there is so much information out there on how we do our facilities, why we do them, how they're done. It's almost to the point of there's so much information out there is how it's explained to individuals, especially to the public, 
at how this is actually done. And I get why people get confused, but here we are. And I just want to make that clarification just because we had so much today. But the five-year construction plan, um, I'm very excited about that. The IPP, the FPPs, which start the process as well. And in those documents, if you look at them, you're going to see a breakdown of the cost again. And so um, if anything, for community colleges in California, I think we provide so much information that that sometimes causes a problem. And it's not intended, but it does. But anyway, I understand it. But, but the beauty of board docs is the public can look at this and see all the details, and I think that's what's fantastic about this. Trustee Zia? Yeah, I, I, I would agree. Um, you know, in fairness, uh, we could probably do better in the visibility because, you know, if someone to the naked eye, um, they don't, like, where would they go to find the board docs? They have to go to about on the uh, uh, homepage, board of trustees, meeting schedule. I mean, uh, I forget how many clicks it takes. Perhaps we can just put it at the forefront. It's just something to consider, just so you know, folks can have uh, we can increase accessibility. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. Take Virginia, your roll, please. Virginia Baxter. Aye. Jeff Kellogg. Aye. Vivian Malaulu. Aye. Doug Otto. Aye. Sunny Zia. Aye. Student Trustee Chavez. Aye. 8.7, Final project proposal and initial project proposals. So moved. Okay, Second. Kellogg. Oh, I don't know. This is like a horse race. Who got in there first? Kellogg. Kellogg. No, I knew that. No, who came second? It um, doesn't matter. I I'll, I'll withdraw my second. <laughs> okay. Oh. Seconded by Trustee Zia. Are there any co questions, comments? Okay. Uh, Madam Pre uh, Secretary? Virginia Baxter? Aye. Jeff Kellogg? Aye. S uh, Vivian Malaulu? Aye. <coughs> Excuse me. Doug Otto? Sunny Zia? Aye. And student trustee Chavez? Aye. Okay, 8.8, .8, new board policy and administrative regulation 6016, debt I issuance. So moved. Okay, moved by trustee Zia? Second. Seconded by trustee Kellogg. Are there any questions, comments? Could you read the whole report to us, please? I read oh, every yeah. single word. Oh, I want you to read it to us. Oh. <laughs> Virginia Baxter? Aye. Jeff Kellogg? Aye. Vivian Malaulu? Aye. Doug Otto? Aye. Sunny Zia? Aye. Student Trustee Chavez? Aye. Uh, now, uh, student services, 9.1, loss of Board of Governor fee waiver update. Uh, Dr. Peterson? So at the last meeting, we, uh, we were requested to provide an update on the loss of BOG fee waiver. Um, we you, were doing our calculations uh, up until yesterday. So uh, you're seeing in front of you a copy of the letter that we've prepared to send to the chancellor's office um, explaining what uh, occurred, what we have done, uh, and then requesting that we be, um, that we not be penalized um, and receive a reprieve for loss of funding. And so that's what we're hoping for. Um, as you can see there, uh, as we discussed before, so the district failed to fully implement the recent regulation changes regarding loss of eligibility for the Board of Governor fee waiver. Um, we, the first part there explains what we shared at the last meeting. Where I'd like to give an update is underneath financial impact. We were able to complete all of our appeal process. Um, initially, you'll see when we did the co total cost uh, calculation, it was 482000 $563. Uh, when we went through and did all of the eligible exemptions um, that were allowed, um, that dropped to $206,793, is what we reported at the last meeting. Um, this, in the April through May, uh, I'd like to really thank our interim executive dean, Robin Darkangelo, for leading this work of doing some intensive outreach to students and communicating for the summer the impact and making sure they were aware of the appeal process. Not only does this uh, protect students for the future moving forward, but it also gives an opportunity to do a retro appeal. And from that, we had 180 students who we reviewed, 44 uh, were eligible for a retro appeal, which then dropped the $206,000 number to 185633 
So this demonstrates that the district, uh, upon um, becoming aware of the issue, did everything to rectify um, and reduce the, the impact uh, financially for the district and then also for the, the chancellor's office. Well, thank you very much because I know this is quite something to come up with these figures. So I really appreciate uh, Robin's work and, and your oversight of this. I also want to thank, so you'll see uh, the table here. We've had great support from IITS, and so I want to thank Sylvia uh, Lynch, uh, her team, May Sakamoto, and Jonah Lopez. So you'll see really listed out the detail of those numbers by term. Um, I, again, uh, what we have done in identifying that this was an issue was to implement an automated uh, process, so this will be um, remediated for any future terms. Uh, that process, we completed the, compo the coding at the beginning of May. We tested at the end of May, and it is fully implemented um, f starting for a summer, uh, summer term, uh, which really is applies to the fall term. So um, this will bring us into compliance moving forward. Uh, we've also created a process to ensure that we are reviewing the um, ineligibility list um, and the communication to students. So. Um, Hopefully this demonstrates, again, the, uh, the serious nature and the work that we've done as a district really to respond to this. Um, you know, we have really done a lot of work that uh, will help our students in the future, um, a as well as really uh, reviewing to ensure that we have systems in place to uh, safeguard against this. Uh, Trustee Otto. Uh, uh, Vice President Peterson, can you briefly explain what the changes are to administrative, the administrative regulations with regard to student financial aid, which are attached? It says they were revised in late April of this year. Yes, so you'll see, uh, Exhibit A is a demonstration to the Chancellor's Office that we had gone through the process of updating our regulations mm -hmm. to reflect the requirements. And so what came to you um, for final approval, of, I think last month, um, included 5013.4 uh, um, all the way through, which demonstrates specifically the Board of Governor fee waiver uh, requirements. Um, and that is, that guides the, um, so our uh, process, our implementation process. Okay, thanks. And then you'll notice uh, as well as we have included Exhibit B, which is the full table with uh, footnotes. Exhibit C is a sample of the communication we provide to students, and then D is the actual fee waiver um, appeal form that demonstrates that, um, that there was a level of rigor to our appeal process. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, um, 10.1, Academic Senate President. Uh, Executive Vice President. President Bynum, do you have a report? President yeah. Baxter, can I just uh, add something oh, before sure, we move on? Um, I didn't see this in board docs, the document that was just passed. Um, I was just wondering, is it out there, the copies made for the public? Did we? Okay, how many copies were made? Okay, just if we can make it available to the public because it wasn't uploaded. Again, we were talking about board docs and accessibility and publics. I, I think that uh, ability to get access it is just something to think about. I think that Vice President Peterson said that the calculations to do the letter weren't, weren't finished until yesterday. Sure, so yeah. So it couldn't have been distributed, but I think they were made available at the meeting tonight, so. Yeah, I just want to make sure that it, that, that point is made, that it has been made available to the public. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, Academic Senate President. Thank you. I will um, deliver this on behalf of our, ac our outgoing Academic Senate President, Karen Kane, who unfortunately couldn't join us tonight. But, um, and I will read what she has written. There's a short report from, the, from her as well as some comments at the end. Um, this is her statement. Um, uh, the following faculty, we're very happy to report, have been selected through interviews as faculty coordinator positions. Jeff Wheeler is the honors coordinator, selected again for a second three-year term. Jerry Florence, faculty professional development coordinator, selected also for a second three-year term. And Rigo Ibarra, study abroad coordinator, selected for his first three-year term. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. 
Rigo Ibarra. Oh, Rigo mm -hmm. Ibarra, okay. Yeah. And um, this is a statement from Karen to the, um, to the board. Um, congratulations to each of these outstanding faculty members. And she says, it's been my honor and privilege to serve the college as the Academic Senate President the last three years. I would like to thank the Board of Trustees for their support of the fine work um, our faculty has done, have done in all academic and professional matters. I appreciate the passionate dedication of the board on behalf of our community, our college, our employees, but most importantly, our students. It has been a pleasure to work with you and learn from you, and I know that you all will continue this wonderful support to our new academic incoming se Senate President, Jorge Achoa. Thank you very much. That's the end of her report. Thank you. Uh, 10.2, Superintendent President. I am going to pass on this report given that the important items that I wanted to talk about, I had the opportunity to mention them during the agenda items. Thank you. Thank you. 10.3, Student Trustee Chavez. Hey, how's it going, you everyone? you have a 10-minute report? 10-minute report? No, I'll make it short, about five minutes, because um, this is my first ever meeting, and it's been a long meeting. <laughs> but uh, Alejandro told me about these long meetings and how fun they were going to be and interesting. Um, so I had my notepad out, and I was taking notes on everything. Um, so, <clears throat> so a little bit about myself. Well, first off, uh, my name is Jorge Chavez, and I'm currently on my fifth semester now here at Long Beach City College. And um, yeah, I got elected as student trustee, and I'm so happy for it. And I'm, and I'm here on the board with you guys, and I'm looking forward to a progressive uh, um, year. And, 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 and you know, we're going to get a lot of stuff done. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to that. So um, things that I'm going to report on, uh, I spoke with Alejandro briefly, and I met with him uh, just about um, him preparing me uh, for these upcoming meetings and what exactly I can expect at Sacramento meetings uh, or the convention meetings with uh, Triple C League. Uh, so um, speaking on Triple C League, I'm going to try to get involved with that. So I'm going to be running for the uh, student member seat that's available. Uh, so the convention is going to be held between August 12th and the 14th. So on the bright side is that I won't have to be flying anywhere, and it's right here on the Long Beach. Uh, wow. Yeah, it's here, so, so it's going to be close by. Um, so yeah, looking forward to that. Um, other than that, I also plan on getting involved with the auxiliary board. And uh, other two boards that I'm serving on here at the Long Beach City College, I'm part of two honor societies. I'm currently the vice president of communications for Phi Theta Kappa. Okay. Uh, and uh, Alpha Gamma Sigma, I'm the Senate representative. So I'm okay. part of those other two honor societies. I'm going to make a quick little, uh, I'm going to touch upon the ASB presentation since Javier wasn't here, uh, just upon um, what he has briefed us all on. So we had a, a brief meeting about two weeks ago, uh, but we were, we didn't, we, we, it was a quorum, so we didn't have the sufficient members to approve the meetings from the last meeting. Uh, so therefore, uh, we just kind of postponed it. So he told us to get in touch with our previous, uh, the one who we just, you know, uh, how do I say this? Predecessors. I was going to say successor, but I'm like, no, that's the one after us. Yeah, that's me. Uh, predecessors. Um, so, uh, so I had to get in touch with Alejandro and get his email. And uh, so now I have him in charge of the email. And then also um, just uh, get ready for summer training. So it's going to be like a two Friday session thing. Uh, so just two Fridays we're going to have to have off uh, the next upcoming one. But other than that, um, that's kind of it for, for the ASB presentation, or like the little ASB aspect. But other than that, I mean, I'm looking forward to, to, to a very productive year, and, and I look forward to uh, new adventures with everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Well, welcome. We're glad you're here. Uh, i got to turn the page. Uh, 10.4, Board of Trustees. Yeah, I'll make a, just a real quick uh, brief report. One, I wanted to um, publicly thank Karen Kane for her service uh, as academic president, uh, academic senate president, and uh, thank her for her three years of service and uh, leadership. And Karen, I know you're ill, but I uh, just want you to know on behalf of the board that we thank you. I'd like to welcome student trustee Chavez. You did a good job at your first meeting. Not bad. Thank you very much. Thanks. And um, just to let everybody know that um, since our last meeting, in addition to commencement and, you know, 1,500 uh, banquets and receptions and <laughs> end of year events, it was a lot of fun. Um, I was able to, uh, a week ago yesterday on June 19th, I was able to welcome uh, our professor, geography professor Ray Sumner and one of our film students, who was also a veteran, John Salcido, to um, 
my district. Um, the neighborhood where I live has two neighborhood associations and uh, WANA, which is Wrigley Area Neighborhood Alliance, um, hosted the short film that we've mentioned at board meetings uh, several times and it was also in one of the uh, president, superintendent president reports. But we were able to welcome them to our district. It was one of our highest attended neighborhood meetings. We probably had about 60 people there who were able to see the work of our LBCC geography department and film student. And it was just so nice to have the presence of the college with the professor there in the west side. So I just, I was very proud of that. And I hope to continue and to do a lot more of uh, bringing LBCC into the community in the future. Have a great summer. It's been a wonderful year. I'd like to thank the staff, the board, for their patience with me on my first year on this board. And I hope to, you know, get better and smoother next year. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Trustee Otto? I'd like to thank the Academy for, oh, no, I'm sorry, that's the wrong speech. <laughs> I'd like to, uh, to uh, thank Vivian's children for what their, <laughs> their, their faith in me and their willingness to stay for these remarks. I know you should be in bed, but the fact that you stayed up just to listen to me is heartwarming. And so with that, I'll finish my report. I, I have to tell you guys why they're here. So today's my 19th wedding anniversary. Oh. And I got the girls in Colorado and the boys had baseball and we're celebrating from a no, distance. I, I can't think of anything more <laughs> romantic than to be at this board meeting. But, but, but notice that my husband didn't come in. No. So <laughs> he just sent the boys. <laughs> How'd they get here? Trustee Kellogg. Happy anniversary. <laughs> My baseball gloves will live the 19 years, so <laughs> it's, uh, but uh, by the way, those East Long Beach uh, pony jerseys are very cool. They have not changed much from when, when I was there. Um, I mentioned, if, can we, if we could get something for Karen Kane, we've done the, like the, uh, uh, something to have yeah. for her. That'd be great, because she has served the college and, uh, and with the academic center, which is so critical to our success, so that would be great. Uh, Thank everyone for the commencement. Really, that was a phenomenal, I think it was the largest group that I personally have seen attending. Uh, the number of people involved, the speeches were outstanding. And uh, so that was really the highlight. So with that, I would just wish everyone the very best. Fourth of July is a week from today. So uh, I hope everyone has a very uh, safe and sane Fourth of July as the, the saying used to go. So uh, with that. That concludes my report. Thank you, Madam hey, President. Not that I'm trying to rush you, Trustee Zia. I'll also try to be brief. Um, I want to welcome um, student trustee, uh, the, uh, your first meeting. Uh, congratulations, you made it. We'd like to break uh, our student trustees in with long meetings. Um, and um, I uh, also wanted to echo how amazing commencement was. and. Um, our valedictorian speech was fantastic. I'm very happy for her. Just really briefly, um, touching on the Measure H on June 13th, um, I appeared before the Board of Supervisors um, and, and Supervisor Han and I, her staff, and I have been working on making sure our community college students are not forgotten because um, with these things, unless you have visibility or ear of someone, um, it usually gets, um, you know, tucked away. So I'm very excited that we're going to get some love from um, the Measure H dollars that the voters have uh, voted for. It's about $350 million a year that is generated. The first phase, is my understanding, is um, access to funding for housing. So, you know, although Trustee Baxter and I have been uh, really working on getting scholarships to defray some of the costs for tuition and books. Um, it's really scratching the surface. It's been um, not to take anything away from the work of the community and uh, our efforts, but it's really been like putting a bandaid on a cancer wound. And I'm very excited that now we have this access and hopefully our students can benefit from it and th those barriers can be removed. And um, I really appreciate your partnership, Trustee Baxter, um, in making this possible. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I'm, I've talked 
all about what my reports were gonna be throughout the meeting, so I'm not going to give a report, but I am very uh, pleased uh, about the Measure H funding uh, because I do think that this is going to be included in the Long Beach College Promise and to promise students that we're gonna do everything we can to keep them in school, to get them here, and to keep them in school. And um, I wanna acknowledge Robert D'Arcangelo who has sat here, because I have great expectations for you uh, in enrollment management, and I, I believe that's gonna be the key, I hope, to keeping students in, in, uh, enrolled in the college and, and uh, creating a wonderful pathway uh, for that. So um, that's my report. 11.1 uh, uh, is future board meetings. Does anybody have anything they want to request? Future board meetings? Future board uh, reports for future meetings. Sorry, I'm getting, I'm getting spacey. I, I, don't, I, I need to drink a Diet Coke, but I'm afraid at 9 o'clock at night to drink one, so I'm trying to keep away. I do. <laughs> A Diet Coke, I want to point that out, okay. Okay, uh, hearing none, we'll go on. 11.2, uh, schedule meetings. Upcoming are BRP, a BPR for IITS, I can hardly wait, and then enrollment management. So those are gonna be uh, wonderful uh, reports. Uh, and Annie, Annie Angle left. So is there anyone here from AFT? No, okay, uh, CHI. Okay, LBCCFA, okay. Uh, there are no public comments on non-agenda items. Uh, we are not going into a second closed session. So the next regular meeting of the Board of Trustees will be held on Tuesday, July 25th, 2017 at the Liberal Arts Campus uh, build, uh, Building Room T1100. Uh, closed session at four o'clock, open session at five o'clock. Uh, I rule that this meeting is adjourned. <laughs>